Okay, it's nine o'clock. We're about to go. Okay, we'll start now. Just hold on. Okay. Right, we just morning everybody. Welcome to room four. We're about to start politics in a minute, but just bear with us. We're just going to wait to, for the room to fill up completely before we start. But we will, we do need to run on time, so we need to get going. Right, Mr. Fowl, I think you should start. I forget. Right, morning everyone. This is uh, this is politics. Very. Uh, uh, looking forward to seeing everyone. We've got Rosie, Jenna and Nina are currently at 12, so we're going to help us uh, just show you this lesson. Uh, and then at the end, if you've got questions, uh, we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, Mr. Webb, could you change to the first slide, please? Yeah. Right. Um, so what we're doing today, and I'll, I'll just actually address the students so people can watch, because it's, it's basically a, a normal lesson. Um, we're looking at a 29 victory for Boris Johnson, and, and we want to know, it, was it inevitable? Uh, and I think there's some things that we want to we want to discuss here. We'll, we'll talk about these do it nows in, in a second. But you know, politics is always this debate, and there's two sides to it, and there are supporters of Boris Johnson, and there are lots of vociferous uh, people that don't support Boris Johnson. And I think you know, we want to understand what, why did Boris Johnson win, and was it was it essentially uh, inevitable? Uh, I think if I just get you three, just have a, a very short think about why you think Boris Johnson won. Just give me a few seconds and then we'll just sort of ask and you say, oh, because of, of this. And uh, do you want me to go first? I might say the most obvious one. Yes, I'm just say, uh, do, do I go first or do you no, want to? No. Oh, All right, so I'm going to say his charisma. All right. <laughs> I was going to say that. I'm going to say his charisma because I think he, on camera, you know, comparing to Theresa May, Comparing to perhaps even Keir Starmer, he's got a lot of personality. He's almost bulletproof. At the moment, that COVID is a bit of a disaster, yet he's so popular. Right, so would one of you like to tell us why you think? I would just go for absolute failure of Theresa May. Yeah, just the fact that she was so awful at her job. Yeah. Right. Anyone would have looked good. <laughs> right, and right. Just desperate. <laughs> so, so a literal alpaca, who actually does look a little bit like us, uh, that would have won. Yeah. Anyone but me. Ella, come in! Thanks for making it. All right. Uh, Jenna, what, what would you say? Is there a reason why you won? I would say, like, how awful they were at the time, and how they didn't have a specific person on record, like the biggest Yeah. So it was one party that were going to just sort Brexit, and then there was another party. So they came in. Oh, thank you very much. And then there was another party that actually just just didn't. All right, um, Nina, have you got any other? Because those are two biggies, aren't they? Yeah. Right. So did she look prime ministerial? Perhaps not. Right, OK, so we've got those three questions just there, a little bit blocked. Um, who are the leaders? What do they stand for? And who votes for them? I would just, Shadi, maybe you vote Rosie and Ella and uh, Jenna and Nina. Just have a, uh, just a quick discussion about those and then we'll feedback. So just those three questions. Did I include that in the example? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you talking Yes. Or oh, actually, you can still use 2019 manifesto because that's pretty much all we know. At the moment, it's just COVID. Uh, think about who votes for them. That's right. That's what we're going to look at today. Anyone okay. Right, before we go and look at the answers, let's just, Rosie, who's, who are the two main, these leaders of the two main parties? Uh, and Keir Starmer, brilliant, okay. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, you can change the slide, thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Um
that's that's all right. We'll, we'll get on to that. Um, Shade, what do they stand for to you? What do you think the Conservatives stand for versus Labour? I think we're on the final. Yeah. Right. So the one part, like and as Jennifer mentioned this earlier, before you were here, so you weren't copying. So one party was going to deal with Brexit, the other one just just didn't know what they were going to do. They were kind of just you know split down the middle. Um, uh, okay, Jenna, who who votes for them? Do you know what's a typical voter? Well, we were saying that there's not really a. We didn't think there was a. You could say there was a typical conservative right. because over time it's become. Um, mm -hmm. I guess they have like more broad appeal. Yes, um, that's true. Whereas with Labour, I think you can say that the typical Labour voter is probably the middle of forty. Yeah. Maybe yeah, like would you say like graduates? Yeah. University graduates? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Nina, looking at this map here, what I've tried to do is um, this is the twenty nineteen result. Blue is Conservative, red is Labour. Green is Plaid Cymru, uh, yellow is SNP, orange tragically is Live Games, and they're barely on there. And then you've got the DUP and, and Sinn Fein uh, in Northern Ireland. Looking at it, what what can you sort of pull out from it? What what can you notice? Um, the majority is conservative, and like in like this main city, it's Labour. Right. So very blue, yeah. apart from red in some urban areas. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Miss Ashton Clark, could you um just push us on one, please, and another one? Please and one more. Thank you very much. So, so we've got conservative support at widespread, and it's only, I would say, England, and that's a real problem. Um, Shadi, why is it a problem that the current government is mostly English support? What's the issue in the United Kingdom? Right. Which country in particular is getting itchy and actually doesn't like being part of a conservative Britain? Uh, there is a bit of that. I, I would say it's, it's north. It's, it's Scotland, isn't it? Scotland, they've got some major issues. Ella, what, what's, what's got Scotland so upset? Right. That's a real thorny issue. Right. What, they, had a, they had a referendum in 2014. They didn't get it. SNP. What made that then? They want another one. What's changed? Uh, the issue of Brexit. Right, Brexit. Uh, why? What did Scotland vote? Uh, Scotland yeah, it's quite strongly. And then England and Wales took them out against their will. So this is this is a huge issue. Uh, Miss Ashman Clark, could you just um, uh, go forward a few? Yeah, that one S and P, Labour's War, Urban. Uh, one more, yeah, and, and one more. Sorry, Miss Ashman Clark, thank you. So I, I think it's you know, Jenna, we often talk about this in the politics because we're looking at elections, but we're also talking about electoral systems. We're also, also talking about parties. There's a lot that you have to sort of marry together. Um, why do the Conservatives get so many seats? I know it's on there, but what they they got they got like how many seats they got they got way more seats, but they didn't get that many votes. They got like forty three percent votes. So it's broad, so they get more seats. Yeah. And Labour's is what? Um, more right, like yeah, like Oldham squash. It's really really complicated. Um, okay, uh, Miss Ashcroft, could you do one more post for us, please? Right, uh, and this is what we're getting to now. Um, we've got, looking at this, rural versus urban, would you say, Rosie? Yes. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, there is a new group now that has swung heavily for Conservative. Um, does anyone know which group it is? Uh, I don't think I've taught you this. It's just literally it's up to you to guess. Say, say it again. Yes. Now, working class, I don't know about you, but I don't really associate too much myself about class these days. Is there another way of measuring someone who's probably working class versus someone who's, say, a professional? Yes, so there is sort of geography in there, and I would say that probably Labour supporters are more tertiary and quaternary, and Conservative are more primary and secondary, yes. But we're, again, it's not about job title necessarily, shall they? Would it be what? Um, it, well, it definitely is, because urban versus rural, but there are there only these urban areas in the UK? No, lots of urban areas have actually gone blue. So it's no longer just that. Um, I can't remember if you might have looked at it with Sir on Brexit, but which group voted overwhelmingly to leave? Do you know? Not sure. Yeah, but we're not. So it's basically working hard, but we don't say that. Not because it's an issue, because actually that's not that strong. 
it's something to do with where you are. Go on. School. It is school. Something about what would it be? Not about teachers. Some of you might go on to do this later. Oh, okay. Right. So it's educational attainment. And essentially, the more degrees you have, the more likely you are to support labour. Uh, where are universities? They're in cities. And that's a massive problem for Labour because it means actually their support is university and uh, urban. And they're in exactly the same place. For Conservatives, thank you, we've got um, non-college educated, didn't go to university. We've got, um, we've got Leavers, so it could be working class. We've got wealthy and they're spread out everywhere. And that's a big problem for Labour. I'm not sure if Labour will get back into power for a while. At the moment, is Boris Johnson the perfect Prime Minister? Hell no. Almost like he wants to get kicked out. Yet, he's got more support than ever. And that tells you that his support is quite sticky. It's not going. Once they support Conservatives and Boris Johnson, can't get rid of him. What's Dominic Cummings been doing recently? He's been dropping some bombs. Yeah, he's been dropping some F-bombs about actually Matt Hancock and what Boris Johnson thinks about him. And, well, I mean, yeah, it's just like, this is what they think. And what's happened to Boris Johnson's support and Conservatives? It's gone up. People don't care. People that support Boris Johnson probably think that Matt, Han Matt Hancock is, I'm not going to say it, but a something hopeless idiot. So, uh, Mrs. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Webb, could you just put us on one more slide, please, sir? Yeah, you, you've got just a minute left, sir. All right. Okay. In that case, I knew this. I'd, I'm massively overrun. Do we want to do Q and A? Uh, yeah, but people need to put some questions in the box if they have any. In the chat. Yeah. yeah. I imagine it's a bit early for Year Elevens, but maybe maybe we'll get some. If not. Um, Mr. Webb, could you just um, tap through while we're waiting? If any questions, and we'll just uh, we'll just see the answers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and one more, just so we can talk about it. And 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 that's the thing. That that final part there, old white wealthy and male. Well, I think that used to be a Conservative voter, actually. I would say, uh, and a Labour voter, young minority, poor female as well. I'd say that's pretty much. And it's no longer the case. Um, women that didn't go to university support Boris Johnson more than they support his Starmer. Uh, and, and essentially, they've both got many. They've both got about the same as well. Oh, yeah, we've got a question, though. This one, no. Um, well, the one thing really is about politics is that obviously it's sort of live history, isn't it? And, Absolutely. And even today, people probably waking up haven't probably looked at the news, but there is quite a draw dropping bit of political news that's landed this morning regarding our health secretary. And who appears to be in a little bit of trouble, and that you know that that for me is why politics is really exciting because it's sort of live history happening and veiling itself in front of you. Um, what we'll career paths can help with uh, doing politics? How can that help the career path? Uh, first of all, I think universities uh, highly um, value it. It does. I mean, I'll actually let the students speak, but I think a lot of our lessons is debates and verbal debates and written debates and if you can debate you know politely uh, and sort of express yourself then that's how you know that that is a life skill that you'll need for everything going from, from interviews to you know any career path it's actually really versatile um, mr webb it says the meeting chat is muted so no one can actually no, i'm seeing it and i'm just uh, questions that's fine that, that's fine yeah that's that's what i would say about that i mean highly highly valued and it does it, you know equips them with every sort of skill they need uh going forwards okay good so next question um it's about content and knowledge how much content is there is it content heavy and what knowledge do you expect to come to the lesson with um, I'll, I'll quickly speak and then actually I'll probably pass on to the students i would say that uh, like all a levels it is it's pretty content heavy and as you've Sort of illustrated the more contemporary your evidence such as may perhaps not well you could talk about matt hancock but a bit of a waste of time 
um, the, um, you will get more marks for that. So keeping your finger on the pulse of current affairs will pay off hugely. Uh, what we want them to come with is a, a genuine interest in things such as democracy, rights, equality, which I would say most young people are interested in. Um, and I think politics is the way forward to sort of express that. But year 12s, you know, you're... It's a lot. It's a lot of content. And if, if you have a genuine spike of yeah. reading the news and yeah. knowing or uh, just spending extra time at night just reading that extra article, it will push you so much further. Right. You will see a massive difference in, say, getting a C to a B. Yeah. Just, just in extra reading yeah. and just having a... For it. Agreed. Thank you, Rosie. Right, I've got a couple more. We're running out of time. Like literally about two minutes left before we all need to move. Um, are you at a disadvantage if you don't do history GCC? I mean, I got Ella, Ella didn't do. I mean, I didn't do history because they're pretty far from me. Nobody really focuses on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ella. Yeah, perfect. You don't need it. Um, would the subject politics solely focus on just the United Kingdom? Uh, no, we do the USA in year 13, which is pretty bonkers and fascinating. Uh, and when you say you do the USA, is that what sort of time period? Uh, uh, as current as possible. So from Trump okay. to Obama and Biden. So I will forget. So it's been a really, really, really very interesting period of learning history. Absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, couple, last couple of things, uh, just around questions around um, the exam, exam prep. Um, how do you help with exam prep? Is it very heavily um, essay based? Uh, yeah, it's all, all essay based, uh, I'm afraid. It'll be, um, there are three two hour exams and there are three essays in each. So. Okay. Um, last one. Does politics relate to citizenship? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. The more engaged you are in your, you know, as a citizen, the more impact you want in your politics. You want it to represent you. Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't in this country. So there's lots of issues that uh, can only be resolved by people getting more involved in politics and, and being active citizens. So yes, it does. Okay, lovely. Thank you, sir. Can you hand over to the next person? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Rosie, Ella, Sade, and Nina. Legends. Love that. Thank you. 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 Th
Okay, so it's 20 past nine, so we're about to start sociology with Mr. Clark and some of the students. And um, hopefully Mr. Clark can hear us. Yes. If you, have any, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A. I will stop Sue in court now and we'll start the Q&A regardless of where Sue's at in his lesson because we need to keep moving on. Hope we can answer every question. If we can't, I'll try and sort of amalgamate the questions together. Brilliant. So over to you, Mr. Clark. Uh, hello there. Welcome. If you're listening, listening virtually, watching virtually, I'm Mr. Clark. I'm head of sociology here at Langley Park School for Girls. Uh, with me today are Eloise and Nina, uh, and we're going to be talking about a few of the issues uh, to do with sociology. Just give you a little bit of a taster. Now, um, what we've got here is this whole idea of the American dream by James Truslow Adams. And as you can see here, everyone at home, uh, James Truslow Adams believes that if you put your maximum effort into everything, then you can make the American dream a reality. And you can see here on the slide, we've got lots of different uh, products in this advertisement, which are all about the American dream. So, uh, sir, if you could just hit those two animations, please. Wonderful. So here's the question my team here are going to discuss. Has every student got an equal chance of making it? What do you think? Um, from what we've done in sociology, I think no, because things such as streaming and labelling and publishing property. Yeah, excellent. Like so what they are. Yes, please. Eloise is going to explain <laughs> streaming and the self-fulfilling prophecy, which we look at. Uh, labelling is like labels that students get given by the teachers. Um, and usually working class students get more negative labels than the middle class students. Yeah. Um, and streaming is like when they get put into different sets to do ability. Um, and the self-fulfilling prophecy is when the students start to like believe what they're being told is true. So if they get given a negative label, they're going to start to believe that they maybe can't achieve yeah. as well as the middle class students. So. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any factors in the home life that could um, affect whether or not a student does well um, in school. What do you think, Nina? Say so like how like culture your parents are. Like say your parents really? like have the like, like to take you to museums or like buy educational toys and stuff like that will affect how you achieve in school Excellent. and like your achievement because if you have more like culture, it will help you like go further. Excellent. Now this is a really interesting point that we look at in terms of um, culture. We've just been joined by uh, Gabby and Ash here. So I'll just come sit there. That's perfect. Thank you. It's right there. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so culture, Nina. What what can we call this in um, in sociology? The amount of culture that a student has and a student can bring. Cultural capital. cultural capital. Right now, what do we mean by cultural capital, and why is it important? Who's going to give this a go? Gabby, what do we mean by cultural capital, and why is it important? It's the amount of culture a student has. They can access the education system. Yeah. Uh, they understand textbooks. They understand the speech of the teacher and everything like this. So for, you, for those of you who are, are listening and watching at home, what we like to do, we like to look at issues of injustice. So James Truslow Adams here believes that everyone has an equal opportunity to achieve. But what we do, we delve deep into the real societal issues that might prevent a student from really achieving. Are there things in society that weigh against a student and prevent them from achieving? So here in uh, sociology at Langley, that's what we, we love to look at. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Could we have the next slide, please? Fantastic. Now, sir, I'm going to get you to click uh, twice, please, on the animation. Wonderful. Right, so one of the other things that we look at when we go into year 13 is crime and deviance. Now, deviance means you don't follow the typical path. Now, what I'm going to present to you now, and we're going to talk about this, is it was once legal to um, cane children until 1986 in this country. And it was legal to use one of these, a guillotine, uh, on prisoners and the, the last execution was in France in 1977. Two more animations please sir. That's lovely, thank you. Now it is illegal, we're going to get you to talk about the uh, top one here. It is illegal to handle a salmon 
in a suspicious manner and to carry a plank on the pavement. Now, uh, one more animation, please, Mr. Webb. Thank you very much, sir. OK, now that's obscured it a tiny bit. But what I'm going to ask you is this. What is it that makes us define something as a crime or something as not being a crime? Who's going to get this done? Go on, then, Gary. Thank you. Is something that maybe is not safe for other people? Right, so something we perceive as not being safe. So where do we learn whether something is safe or not? Eloise, what do you think? Um, we're like socialized by our parents. Wow, that's brilliant, brilliant. So do we learn about what's, uh, whether or not something is a crime through socialization? Or do we biologically know whether or not something is a crime? Is it nature or is it nurture? What do you think? Um, well, doesn't it depend? Yes. On some time. Okay. Like, if there was a new crime, or crime was being happening every day, and then there was a new crime now to what there were 100 years ago. So that's, that's fascinating. So uh, about 20 years ago, we, um, we didn't really have the concept of cybercrime, which we have to this day. So what makes society decide whether or not something is a, is a crime. Is it related to what Gabby just said about whether or not it makes people feel safe? Or is there something else that decides whether or not we decide something is a crime? What do you think? Like, it depends, like, as we go on, like, as things that get worse, and, like, it depends on, like, the severity of the situation okay. and, like, the crime. And people, if people generally think that's a bad thing to do, like say the plank thing, I don't think nowadays people would think that's a bad thing. But like back then when the law was established, you might think, oh, that's bad then. But like now times have changed, people think, oh, it's better or it's worse. Right, that's an excellent answer. These, yeah. these answers are really good. Gabby? Yeah. Experience, that's right. So does society collectively decide whether or not something becomes a crime and other things are no longer crimes? Is it society that does that? Yeah. Yeah, Ash, yeah. Okay. Right, so the government, and um, Ash is talking about the government and control. So does, does our definition of crime come from the very top of society? Is it our leaders who decide whether or not something is a crime and we get little say? Or do, can we move, can we mobilise public pressure to create crimes if we see something we don't like? And like pressure groups, like so there's a protest, Brilliant. like if people protest on a certain issue, or like they get the, the government's um, like interest, and then they'll want to act on that issue. Yeah. And so, like they want the society and the public's best interest to be like taken into yes. account. Yes, because and then they want to be re-elected as well. So that could have to, well done. And Gabby, yep. I think society is what determines if something is unsafe or not. You know, yeah. good for our safety. And it's the government that sees what society is saying and yeah. decides whether or not to make it legal or illegal. Right. And the majority of the time, they overlook ideas, which is what Nina said about yeah. tradition. Yeah. How society decides to get the government involved. That's fantastic. And so what we look at here, really good answers. Thank you for it. We look at whether how we construct define what crime is. And the final one here says, so moved on to here. Um, this is looking at beliefs. This is a beautiful island called Kefalonia. Uh, a Greek island, and what we've got here, two more animations, please, Mr. Webb. Thank you, sir. Okay, and what we have here, this is St. Erasmus. He's the uh, patron saint of Kefalonia. And if you've read Captain Corelli's Mandolin, this is what the sign is about. Every August the 16th, um, this preserved saint is passed over these people on the floor and uh, in their hope of being healed. So we look at beliefs in A-level sociology. And uh, so what I want you to do is two more animations, please, sir, or maybe one. Um, well, that's perfect. Thank you, sir. So the question for the team is, is society becoming more or less religious or more spiritual? And we've got about a minute to talk about this. Gary. I think it's not necessarily becoming less religious, but I think that more religious all the, all the society was the main, which was Catholicism. Yeah. And now there's there's a huge like community of different religions. 
Yeah. I don't think it's becoming less religious. I think it's becoming more religious. Very interesting point. So it's actually, it's just there's a lot of variety, choice and diversity in, in religion. So are we, so therefore, Gabby and everyone else, is it the case that we're not becoming secular, secularized, which means less religious? It's just religion is changing form. What do you think? Lena, what do you reckon? I would say it's not changing form, but like people are like accepting other people's religions more. Like back in the day, people would be like, have more hatred against people with other religions, but like, everyone's becoming more like collective like as together so like they will accept more and then each of the religions can, like come together as more of a, not a whole but, yeah like it's just becoming more like Connected. That's fantastic. Um, so these are this is just a taster of the kind of subjects we look at. Thank you so much. We're going to do some questions and answers now, sir. So I'm ready when you are. Yeah, lovely. Great. Thank you, sir. I, I found that very interesting. Hopefully everybody else did. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions to start us off with. Um, standard question, what careers can this subject help with? Um, I think um, uh, sociology is, is like the kind of like transition subject for some really interesting careers. Uh, a lot of people, it's about working with people. So things like social services, teaching, international development. We've got a lot of people who go into criminological related degrees. Um, it, it's, it's kind of like the, the people person's career um, sociology and it's great because it, it opens so many doors into so many different areas of society it gives the student chance to think about what they really want to do in the future um where is sociology useful if you want to go to study law what was that sorry if you want to study law at university is sociology useful oh uh, yeah i think they uh really complement each other incredibly well we have a lot of sociology students who are also taking law too. Is that any of you for here? <laughs> yeah, Nina mean, as well. Um, and the reason why they work well together is because I believe you first need to understand society and people, and then you understand about the laws that affect the people. So that's why a lot of students really um, like to do law and sociology together. Um, and we there's also a lot of cross-curricular links between law and sociology too. So when we look at the criminal justice system, that's covered in law and it's covered intensively in our sociology A level as well. So they really work well together. OK, so on that subject, so what other subjects are often the common combination with sociology? Right. So this could take quite some time. So psychology and sociology work really well together because psychology is usually how we understand and perceive the world world and sociology is how the world affects us. Now there's a little bit of crossover between two of those concepts, but certainly psychology and sociology work incredibly well together. Uh, religious studies works well because we look at beliefs. So if you're taking philosophy and ethics, then you understand how uh, people uh, become religious or what affects their religious beliefs. Geography is uh, a real good connection with sociology. So when you look at issues of globalization across the world, how we've become the borderless uh, planet, that really fits in with sociology too. And I could keep going, sir. <laughs> There's a lot um, of them. Yeah, right, right. Um, several questions about the exams. Are they essay based? Is it all exams? Um, and a lot of this I know is on the website, sir. Yep. But I might want to cover that. I'm, I'm happy to go over that too. Yes, we are very essay based. There's, there's no denying. Um, but it's actually a really useful skill because it's, it will teach you the skills of evaluation, analysis. Um, it's one of these subjects where you get to write, you get to be creative, you get to express your ideas and you're moved by a sense of injustice. When it comes to the exams, we've got three exams at the end of um, uh, year 13. All three are two hours long and they cover the topics of education, families, beliefs, research methods, crime and deviance and theory. You'll certainly get a real broad understanding of how the world works if you take this subject. Lovely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, students, for doing that. And um, we're just going to shut down for five minutes whilst we wait for the next presenter to arrive. OK, thank you to all of you uh, watching and listening at home. Um, you know, we hope you really enjoy your time at Langley. Cheers, sir. OK, thank you.
So can you ask the students to sit as close to possible to this camera? So they need to be sitting down in this corner as, as close as they can because we, we lose people. So they can bump across a few from where they are. So you're currently on mute. If you take yourself off mute, but obviously we're broadcasting live so people can hear what you're saying. Where's best for me? It would be quite nice for this. Well, well, yes. So, um, most people have, have actually stood by the board and not have been off camera. But if you want to be on camera, sir, that's that's fine. You can stand where you want. I'm Langley's greatest asset. That's okay. and, I, and, I will, um, and I will move the slides forward when you ask me to, okay? Okay, great. So you want me on mute still or stay as we are? We're going to go live. Well, we are live now, but we're going to start in two minutes' time. You can do that. Yeah. I'm trying to where I stand, because you're your way. I guess I might. Have got a pen? Right, so do you want to unmute un the mic again because I muted you so nobody could hear it. And I can... Okay, is that working? That is great, sir. So I'm going to hand over to the Law Department. Thank you very much. So good morning. Welcome to A-Level Law. Um, Take possession with some of our students today. My name is Mr Saunders Griffin. Um, I'll be teaching law in year 12, please join us, so you'll be in lessons with me. So students in the class, I would like you to take a look at that image you've got there, that's the image on the board. What is that image of? I'm sure you can recognise it. And think about those two words there. Explain the difference between voluntary and involuntary. Put yourself, if you can, what crime might you associate with that image? Feel free to discuss, absolutely fine. Yeah, you can see some writing there. Do feel free to discuss as well, you know. Okay, so what did you put down, Matthew? Um, deliberate and accidental. Or what's that, the second one? The second one, the difference between voluntary and involuntary. Is that what's impressive? 
deliberate and accidental. Yeah, fantastic. What did you identify for that image of, uh, Rishka? Um, yeah. Um, did you really think of a crime that could be associated with the theory? Um. All right. We haven't just covered it yet. Around the room, anyone else? Rosie? Negligence. Negligence. Yeah. What did it mean to be negligent? Uh, Failing to do something you should have done. Can we move on please, sir? Absolutely right. So voluntary, when someone chooses to do something. Involuntary is when someone chooses that doesn't choose to do something. We're looking at gross negligence manslaughter today, which is an example of involuntary manslaughter. Someone hasn't chosen to kill, but they have ended up killing someone. Please. Next slide, please, sir. So, gross negligence of manslaughter is defined in the case of Adamarco. Could we just run through those, please, sir? It's a type of involuntary manslaughter where there's three parts. The defendant owes a duty of care, there's a gross breach of that duty, and this breach causes the victim to die. Go forward just one more and it will show us the case there. That's Adamarco. So if this is defined by a case of Adamarco, is it statutory law or common law? What do you think, Ellie? Absolutely right. Okay, let's move on, please. We're just going to focus on this concept of a breach of duty. For gross negligence manslaughter, there needs to be a gross breach of duty. Now, the definition of a gross breach of duty comes from the case of Bateman, where a doctor treated a woman in childbirth badly. He didn't send her to hospital for five days. This case established, the jury will decide what a gross breach is, and this is the question they will ask. Did the actions of the defendant show such disregard for the life and safety of others that it was a crime and deserved punishment? That's the test the jury will use. Let's go forwards and look at this in a bit more detail. So, disregard. What does that word mean? Think amongst yourselves. How would you define that? We're trying to decide how are we going to know if someone's actions show such disregard for the life and safety of others that it's a crime and deserves punishment? Lack of care. Yeah, that's what you do. Ignoring. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? Pushing it aside. Yeah. Ella? Completely ignoring it. Yeah, absolutely right. We've got ignoring there. OK, so did they ignore the life and safety of others that it was criminal, that ignorance of it? Let's move forward, please. So why Grenfell? Well, on the 14th of June 2017, a fire broke out in Grenfell Tower, causing 72 deaths, with the worst residential fire in the UK since World War II. Kensington and Chelsea Council updated the flats in 2016. The council's director of housing was in charge of a cost-cutting exercise that saw metal cladding swapped for flammable plastic-filled panels. These did not comply with building regulations and fueled the fire. What you'll see in the image there is the fire spreading across the flammable cladding. The cladding is the coating of a building on the outside. So here's what you're going to decide. Can we forward this, sir? What evidence is there that the director of housing showed a gross breach of duty? I want you to apply the law here. Where did they show a gross breach? Did the director of housing show such disregard for the life and safety of others that it was a crime and deserved punishment? You've got the extract there. With your partners, can you write them just a short application of that gross breach, please? Uh, 
What evidence is there in that extract about the director of housing's actions? How can we apply it there? Hey, well done year 12. Looks like you've got some really good answers. Matthew and Nina, can I ask you to turn around and share your answer with Rishka and Ellie? Do you want to turn around with Ella? Do you agree, disagree? What did you write? Do you want to you get the same points, different points? Can you get an answer together that you're willing to share in a moment, please? Um, Brilliant. Now, Linda, what did that show us with regard to? Let's look at it. Uh, can we hear some of your answers, please? Um, Ellie, can you share what you've written? Um, we saw the director of housing options as a cheaper option, even though if people are interested in how to build a house, it's a cheaper option. Well done. I think that's a really good response. Why is it good, Nina? Um, because, like she mentioned, like she applied the knowledge, like she applied like the cladding, and she swapped it out, and then she applied like that being focused on the cost rather than. Brilliant. What else did Ellie say in her answer? What else did she use, Matthew, that would add clarity there? Um, specific details for the scenario. Yeah. And what else about the case and the actual law? What's the test, Rishka? And did the defendant's action take those actions to answer the question? Absolutely right. She linked the facts of that scenario there, Grenfell, with the law. Disregard of life and safety of others. So, Last question, would you find the director of housing guilty? What do you think? I'd love to hear what some of the people joining us remotely think as well, answers in chat, and then we'll have an opportunity for some question and answer. So have a discussion, let's see what we think. What do you think, Ella? Um, I think it could be found guilty because we showed that the complete was about the new article. Okay, interesting. Do you agree, Ms. Kerr? Yeah. Yeah? Across the room, do we agree, disagree? Yeah. Okay, we all agree. I'll, I'll be keen to hear what people think in the chat in a moment. Now, the reality of this, and this really is one of the worst incidents that have happened in decades, there are no charges yet, and it will be very hard secure a charge for gross negligence manslaughter because it's very hard to prove that one specific person owed that duty and thus breached it. But also you can think about corporate manslaughter. The police are thinking about charges of corporate manslaughter for the council, but they're not going to do that until the investigation is fully wrapped up towards the end of this year. So it's an ongoing thing in law. We're always looking at the developments in the law, how it's changing, whether it's achieving justice, that's what we're discussing with protocols. So I think that brings us to the time to open it up to questions from students and to hear about your thoughts. Thank you, Sue. Great. We've got some questions coming in already. Hello, Mr. Fox Joyce. <laughs> um, right. So the first question is a couple, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. It's really about doing A level law and then wanting to move on to do it at university and 
whether it's essential, not necessary at all, or preferable? Yeah, that's a really good question. If you want to study law at a, a, if you want to study law at university, you do not need to study at A level. It does help though, but it is absolutely not a requirement. If you do want to study law at university, I recommend you do um, engage in humanities subjects, so things like English, history are really helpful. Law is a really good choice. It is a fantastic route into it because it means that with, if you were to study at university and you study law at A level you've really got good knowledge already as you see from the students here they're already using legal terminology the ability to apply the law use of cases so it is a good choice but it's not essential lovely great right now this is interesting so during non-covid times what sort of trips do we run to sort of bring the subject to life a bit more so we like to go up to london to go to the courthouses we'll go to the high courts uh, Supreme Court and go and watch a trial. We've gone to the Old Bailey and actually gone and seen a trial in process. Uh, as part of going to the High Court, we would go for students to undertake their own mock trial, um, which is actually run, uh, being run by the High Court. And that's, that's really good, putting the law into practice, but being in the place where it is, walk around the temple, um, which is where the legal profession is based in London. So they're, they're really great opportunities. Being this close to London is really great for us as well to do that. Great, so, so the next question is about opportunities when you do law, sort of career opportunities. So I think maybe outside of being a solicitor or being a barrister, which are obviously the most obvious common paths from, from doing a law degree maybe, um, what other opportunities do law offer? I know lots of our business studies students take law, for example. Many students who study law also study business and every business will have to do some legal compliance so there's loads of opportunities in businesses of all different types across the country that need people with a legal background so that's that's the first part in business also the civil service and working in that so one of my friends studied law at university she now works in the department for culture media and sport um, advising on the legal issues to do with data for example so the civil service is really good option for people to think about that um, and also lots of think tanks lobbyists groups like that um, that there are fantastic opportunities there so all sorts of things across the country many different sectors the other thing about law is that because it's a very analytical subject you develop research skills you develop the ability to analyze and present that in an argument now that's something that all sorts of businesses really really want to see from people so even if you're not doing it in law You've got those skills that you can apply to different, different sectors. Right, great, thanks. Question for the students here. They're going to get shocked here when I ask them this. Um, why do you enjoy law? What do you like about doing law? Tell us how good Syria and Miss are. Come on. <laughs> Don't be shy, folks. This one's probably the most interesting subject. Can we, so, can we speak up a bit? We can't quite hear you. It's probably one of the most interesting subjects you can do at A level. Um, it's never, it never gets boring, so to say. Um, there's always something different you'll be learning, and the cases are particularly interesting, learning about why a law is applied in a certain way. Any of us? Sorry, you didn't quite catch that, sir. Can you say it again? I said we are hoping that none of our A-levels are boring, but... <laughs> um, no, no. What, are the, what are the topic units called, sir? So, there's three papers. Paper one is on criminal law, that's what this was all about. Paper two is tort law, and paper three is contract law. Within each of those papers, there's a number of different topics that cover a really broad range of, of different areas of law. And probably the most useful ones for career progression as well. If you go to university, you'll be doing those. And if you were to use them in a business, they're the ones that are going to be most helpful. Great. And the, and the last question is, what uh, what sort of things can you do in and outside of class to enrich the subject? Do we do debates? Do we do moots? That type of thing. Yeah, in loads of class discussion, debates, discussions, much like the kind of session today, which was on a very topical and relevant issue. 
it's actually the law is a living, breathing thing. It changes all the time, and all the lessons kind of link to that. So there's lots of opportunities to discuss about that. Extracurricular activities, we've got a number of different you know, clubs and stuff that you can do outside of lessons that link to humanities, to law, and put that into practice. Um, lots of students who study law also do other subjects like politics and history. So there's kind of opportunities for debates. Yeah. Extra activities like that. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, thank you everybody. That's great. We're just going to move on to health and social, and we're just going to go quiet whilst we set that up over the next one. Thank you very much, Hi Miss, welcome to Hi. Uh, who have we got who have we got Miss Harris? Yeah. Great, okay, so uh, we're gonna start in a sec. Obviously we, uh, um I can switch to the students, they're sitting close to the camera, which is great, so we can hear them and see them. Yeah. Um just bear with me one sec. That's right, I'm just waiting uh, for one more student as well. Great, and then just um Ask me to move the slide on once you're ready. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll need to start this because we need to run on time. Cool. So, over to you. So, um, welcome to Health and Social Care. Um, I'm Miss Harris. I'll be your teacher come September um, for either the single or the double award. Um, and we're going to run through a Unit 2 lesson on LO2, which looks at discrimination. Um, across the next 10 minutes or so. So if so, you'd move on to the next slide for me. Oh. Miss, it doesn't look like the slides have been put in. Can you do it without? Uh, no, they are in there. I put them in the folder. OK, I um, just suddenly jumped to that at the moment. Um, can I can I share them on my screen? Yes, I think you can, well, you can try to, yeah. But then I need to be logged in. Uh, oh, actually, 
that name. I'm really sorry, I don't know why they haven't been put in there. It's all right. Okay, it's just what I learned at the PowerPoint. The do it now task is just to write what you associate with the word discrimination. So any words that you associate with discrimination, just write those down for the minute and then I'll just once I've got this from my email, then I can share that on the screen. And Miss, I'm going to try and track them down myself now on here. So you can yeah. teach me how to try and find them now. So just write any words you just associate with the word discrimination to start us off again. So we're saved in that area where like all the subjects are, you know, where Sir links the... I'm trying to find the notes, Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Yeah, that's it, sir. You know what I mean? Yeah, just show that slide, that's where we're at. Thank you. Okay, so what sort of words do we start? Let's start. Millie, give us a word associated with discrimination. Stereotyping. Stereotyping, good. Depending on what else? Stereotyping. Okay, so thinking about what we might define discrimination as, Lady? Uh, prejudice. What do we mean by prejudice? Can you give us an example? Yep, yeah, okay, so like a free judgment, Ava. Uh, labeling. Labeling, good. And Amy, one more? Judgmental. Judgmental, okay, so obviously judging people based on certain things. And we're going to talk about that um, across the next couple of slides. So if Sir moves on to the next slide for me. So, what I'd like you to do, girls, is write down the following three headings. So, we've sort of touched on what discrimination is there. So, when people judge others based on the differences and use their differences to create disadvantage or oppression. So you can see three headings there on the screen, a seven to eight year old man, a teenage boy with multiple face piercings and tattoos, and a 16 year old mum. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just write those three down and then write any words that come to mind that you would associate with those three people. Okay, so any words that you think immediately of, you know, I think this person is so-and-so, write that down and then we'll have a little discussion based on that. Anything you think of when those you look at those three people, what sort of things might you associate with those? Right. 
Okay, and stop there, there we go. So, we go for each one, obviously just say why you thought that, so why did you associate with those words with that person. So, Penny, we'll start with you. A 78-year-old man, what do we put for that person? Uh, very old, and relaxed. Okay, and why might you describe that that person, Penny? Because when you're older, you need to be healthy. Yeah, good. Okay, so obviously losing our dependence, we're starting to obviously get a little bit immobile, we're struggling with movements. Okay, so I think obviously Lane, do you write fragile as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so fragile is thinking about our movements, how we move across. Ava, what about our second one? A teenage boy with multiple face piercings and tattoos. I just said normal because... Why is that normal to you? Yeah. Good, okay, it might just be a normal thing. Anybody think anything different to what Ava did? Or did it all sort of have, we thought that was normal? Amy, um, did you also write something? No, I said rebel. Rebel, okay, why did you say rebel? Because, I don't know, just because if he's a teenager and he's got that tattoo, he's like a cockroach like that. Yeah, okay, so obviously going against sort of society's norms and what we would expect, so although obviously Ava's saying that's quite normal. Some of us think that actually that's going against the grain, what normally we would say. Um, and many, our last one, a 16 year old single mum. What do we put for that? Independent. Independent, good. Anything else knowing you can add to independent? Uh, brave. Brave, why did you put brave? Because he's able to like, still do that. Um, yeah, he's able to do that. Okay, so thinking about where she is at the point in her life, obviously that's quite a brave thing to do. Um, if so, you can move on to the next slide for me. Um, so, as you can see, there's some different forms of discrimination there. So, things about age, gender, race, disability, culture. Um, we've obviously discussed it a little bit before. Just having a think, can we think of any direct examples for any of those that we could think about in a health and social care setting? Well, now, Penny, if I said to you race, for example, or disability, what might be an example of that in a health and social care setting? Um, Good, okay, so obviously things about our differences could be to do with religion, okay, or thinking about what that might prevent us being able to do. Is there another way we can just group these types of discrimination, Amy? Um, Other than what's on the screen, obviously there's our basis, what are they two types of discrimination? Um, direct and indirect. Good, so what do we mean by direct and indirect, Amy? Um, is direct towards someone? Yeah. And then indirect is like the other. Yeah. What else would you say for indirect over? The indirect is like the policies that could affect um, how they <laughs> get help or. Yeah. Okay. So obviously not directly affecting the person that we're obviously discriminating against, whereas direct comes with some form of intention or some form of purpose. So they're doing it intentionally without realizing. Um, if so, you can move on to the next slide for me. Um, so we've talked about those eight bases of discrimination. Um, so just to finish us off on your piece of paper, why is it so important in health and social care that we understand those different types of discrimination? Think about the people that work within a setting, whether that's a hospital or a residential home. Why is it really important for those people that we understand where discrimination occurs from and how obviously then to react to it and the impact it has. Who might have fixed it? A few more seconds. 
finish off the why it's so important that we understand discrimination and where it comes from. Okay, Millie, start us off. Um, why is it so important? I said we need to know where, where it comes from so that we can help with it. So that everyone can like, feel welcome and like, get the support that they need without feeling like they can't. Good, really good. Okay, so think about support that's available. I think if we could add to what Lily's already just said. Um, it could stop them from getting like care in the future. Yep. Good, okay, so making them feel slightly vulnerable. Kelly, what else do we have on ours? Um, things like Good, okay, so obviously if we're working in a care home, for example, we might speak to our manager. If it's a resident, obviously they've got to maybe go to someone that they feel safe with, that they can trust. If it's someone obviously that's causing them issues. Okay, so obviously that importance of health and social care, of knowing where the discrimination occurs, is really important that people working within that society are able to reflect on those attitudes and how they can in turn obviously address those across the course of when they're in that setting. Um, have I got time, sir, to do the next one? Or you're on mute, sir. Uh, if you're really quick, but we need to do some Q and A's as well. Yeah. Okay. It's a short video, so that's the, it will take like two, three minutes. So I don't know if you want to do the Q&A or... No, we won't, we won't have time to play video. Okay, that's fine. Just do the... Okay, so thinking obviously about social class, specifically within discrimination, so that's one form of basis where we come from. Um, what do we mean by social class? Um, isn't it like... Yeah, go on, use Isn't it like... Um, like middle class, middle yeah, good. Okay, so like middle class, working class, obviously upper class, at what point we are in society. So, how would we define social class, ladies? So, like, just like Good, yeah, really good. Okay, so obviously, where we are, okay, thinking about obviously the place we have in our society to do with hierarchy or obviously economical status, like ladies just touched upon. When we obviously look Amy just answered this question at the bottom, what are social classes, so we talked about working and middle and upper. If we think about those two questions at the bottom, just to finish, to what extent does the media lead to certain groups of people being stereotyped or labelled, and how could their perception of social class affect the way that care practitioners treat individuals in need of care and support? Just very quickly have a 30 second think, you don't need to write it down, just a question to finish off before we do some Okay, anyone want to go at your own question to start off? Go on, uh, pick one, Penny, and then I'll do one. Just um, the first one, yeah, I'm saying that in the media, those who are in the working class spaces are often very tight or labeled as people who don't work as hard sometimes. So it affects those people. Yeah, okay, so obviously the media has an impact on how we view people, how they're stereotyped, and they're just touched upon, and how obviously that discrimination then occurs as a result. Um, so if there's any questions, sir, that students have, um, they can ask them now in the last five minutes. Right, great, thank you, Miss. Right, we've got several questions. Um, the first one, I know this is on the on our website, but just to clear up the idea of the two courses and how the sort of single double idea and what yeah. they're going to. Um, okay, so our single award, we run across six units, so that's the equivalent of one A-level, and then our double award is 12 units, which is the equivalent of two A-levels. So my class and the single class at the moment, they run on three double periods a week. Um, and that's two units, whereas the double class will have four doubles a week and they'll be doing three units across that time. So looking at, like we just touched upon, so unit two, equality and diversity, um, they may look at unit four, so things like anatomy and physiology, um, or any then internally assessed units, so coursework, so like nutrition um, or person-centred care approaches, um, as well as any other units obviously on our spec. Okay, Miss, we often call them single and double. What are their official names, just so people know and they don't get confused? Uh, so the single is the extended certificate, 
um, and our double is our diploma. So that's what they're technically referred to on the spec. Yeah, uh, and you'll see in our blocking when you want to choose, if you want to do the diploma, you have to choose in two different blocks because obviously they count as a, as a double, so that's important to know. Great. Um, can you just explain to us the, the sort of percentage breakdown of coursework versus exams? Um, so there's a split, so it will depend on what award you choose. So if it's a single, so it's then certificate, you'll only do four sort of mandatory units. So we have mandatory and optional units. So mandatory are ones that we have to complete across the course of two years. So that will be four units for the single, the extended certificate. Um, for the double or the diploma, that will be seven. Um, and then the other five um, will be optional. So they might be exam or internal. Um, it depends on obviously what we map out on our curriculum and thinking about across the sort of course of two years. Uh, but it tends to be weighted towards more coursework than it is exams. Uh, there's fewer examined units than there is internally assessed. Um, so it will feel like an even balance. Um, and those exams will be sat at different points of the year. So, for example, we could sit an exam in January if the, if the unit's like a fairly short unit, the right run from September to December. We might decide that things like Unit 4 that require a little bit more time, um, that will be sat in June. So, we'll have a little bit longer to go through that unit because it's on like a nationally. So, a little bit more in depth so we can cover it in greater detail. Right, lovely. And obviously, this is a, voc a vocational course, so we have a question about sort of getting outside of the classroom and experiencing real life and how we apply that in health and social care. So, what sort yes. of things are we planning? Yeah, so obviously, this year's been slightly restricted, uh, but from September, hopefully, with restrictions lifting, um, we'll be able to go sort of outside into the real world. So, getting opportunities for work experience, um, so to visit care homes or hospitals or different health settings. Um, obviously shadowing people, so shadowing staff, thinking about can we offer additional qualifications on top of what we're doing. So for instance, in Unit 3, we cover health and safety, um, and part of health and safety is looking at first aid. So offering a first aid qualification alongside that, so not only obviously boosting our knowledge in terms of when we come to our exam, but obviously furthering our skills, obviously for when you go to the workplace, whether that's in nursing, midwifery, or any other sector within health and social care. Great, and finally, in the last minute, just regarding the summer work that we've posted, is there any? And then what do we do with it? Um, so there will be some. Um, I need to look at it because it may change in terms of the structure um, of what we're setting, but it will be based upon sort of what units will start in September. Um, so it's likely that there will be one exam and one internal, so one coursework unit. Um, so it may be to do with like further reading. So just so we have a bit of prior knowledge um, and in terms of exams it may be sort of looking at some sort of questions and just working out what we would do and then obviously when we come to the lesson we can use that um, so yes it will go on it may be slightly different to what it already is um, but yes there will be some form of summer transition work between the period you are in now to when you come and join us in September. Great and that idea of um, students being given free learning work is something that we do here just as routine during the school year that you'll get work you need to do prepare for the lesson so you know, sort of homework that happens before the lesson not after it so it's it's that will be slightly new to lots of students because you don't do that gcse in the in general right lovely thank you miss thank you students perfect thank you sir you are free to go thank you very much <laughs>
Okay, welcome everybody to Philosophy and Ethics. Can I ask Miss just to unmute yourself on, on the computer? And ideally, can I ask the students just to bump across towards the camera a couple of seats so that we can hear you, or one seat, because that will really help. Lovely, thank you. Right, Miss, you're still on mute, so if you can unmute it. There we go. Hi, Miss. Hi there. How there are you? Right, great. So we're going to hand over to Miss Adesolo for philosophy and ethics. Miss, it when you need me to move the screen on, just let me know. Oh, thank you. I'll hand over to you. Just bear with me. There we go. There we go. Right. Can we have it in full screen mode, please, sir? Uh, we can't, we can't, sorry, this is how it is, sorry. No problem at all. So, welcome everyone to Philosophy and Ethics this morning. I've got two of our current year 12 students um, in with me today whilst we begin uh, to give you a sneak peek as to what you might expect from a typical Philosophy and Ethics lesson. Uh, if we can have the next slide, please, sir. So, what we're going to try and achieve today then is having you explain how it is that ethics or ethicists might make moral decisions. Uh, the key learning objectives then are to explain how ethicists make moral decisions and to assess the strengths and weaknesses of legalism, antinomianism and situation ethics, which are all ways um, of making moral decisions. So first of all, have a read the quote that you see on the board in the orange box. Read the quote, how far do you agree? Also consider then why someone might disagree with you, as well as understanding of your perspective, why might someone disagree with you? So Quake says, the morality of an action depends on the situation. And this is from Joseph Fletcher, who is the founder um, and creator then of Situation Ethics, a liberal way of doing ethics that's quite the opposite from absolute ethics. To what extent should love be a deciding factor when making ethical decisions? The morality of an action depends on the situation. What do you think, Selma? Um, I agree with the quote because I feel like in everyday life there are things that influence the actions that you take and you can't really like know what to take on the situation. Um, Cressida, can you extend on that for me? The morality of an action depends on the situation. I would also agree with this statement. Um, this is because in certain situations, the most loving thing to do would be to help someone, and that might break the rules. So I do understand that people may disagree with that quote, as if everyone just done the most loving thing, there would be chaos, as everyone would try to justify what their actions would be. What extent do you think then that love should be a deciding, deciding factor when making moral decisions? Should love ever be put into the equation, as Joseph Lecter would suggest? Um, I think sometimes it should be put into action, but then in certain situations, doing the most loving thing for one person could be not loving for the rest, that could be quite selfish. What is the problem? Follow up to that then. So, what's the problem with love as a, as a means of making more decisions, what should be used instead? Should we employ the rule of love or should we employ more absolute theories such as natural moral law, which basically relies on religious doctrine? Mm. Yes, sir. It would be better if there was both, but if love can be quite subjective, so everyone has a different view on love. So if there could be a system where we use love and still follow principles that are a bit absolute, it would work better. Absolutely. So when considering that, who teaches, whose key principle or golden rule centres around love that actually would fulfil both of those areas? Do you think of someone in the Bible who uses the principle of love as well as the doctrine that we would follow follow rules? Jesus. Which which quote am I thinking of? Love thy neighbour as thyself. Absolutely. So the idea that we'd love our neighbour as ourselves and come to more decisions through the showing love, loving kindness to, to our neighbours and people how we'd like to be treated. 
Next slide, please. Uh, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please, sir. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, Miss. Okay. So when it comes to making ethical decisions, there are three main branches um, that we, we use in first instance. The most common then being um, situation ethics, which is a relative system of, big, um, a relative system of ethics that uses the rule of unconditional love. So essentially, when making decisions, we are to judge every decision that we make and prioritise love. So a situation, situation is then enters into a dilemma with the principal rule that love is the kind of tenant or key tenant that needs to be abided by. A situation follows moral law or violates it according to love's needs first. So essentially they would suggest that lying would be justified if it serves the purpose of love. On the Quite the opposite of that then would be the legalistic approach, uh, having fixed moral ideas and moral rules and regulations. Uh, it avoids um, avoids love, avoids um, looking at things situationally. Um, it is absolute in nature, and so it would be things like the Ten Commandments. Follow these rules, live well, love God, avoid evil. The opposite of legalism then would be antinomianism. It's the reverse of legalistic ethics. It literally means against law um, and essentially for many creates an anarchic society where no rules exist and everyone is free to do exactly what they want. What I'd like you to do then is based on these three areas consider some of the strengths and limitations of each of these ways of making ethical decisions. So what would be, in your opinion, just give you a minute to think about it and then respond, some of the strengths and weaknesses of legalistic ways of making ethical decisions. Strengths maybe? Start there, start with the strengths. Why is legalism a good thing? Um, they set rules so you know what you can come. Absolutely, give me an example, set rules. Like you can't murder someone or steal. Absolutely, so law says, the legal laws would say do not kill, as well as religious laws, <coughs> excuse me, Thank you. As well as the religious laws, Ten Commandments, Exodus 2013, do not kill. Give me a strength, thank you for that. Give me a strength of um, antinomianism, um, Cressida, but against law. What might strength be there? People that feel restricted by the law and work together do the right thing. Absolutely. So a weakness, Sam, if you can come back on that then, what would be a weakness about people not having restricted rules and regulations, what would be a weakness? Society won't really run well because people just do whatever they want. It'll just be chaos. Can you think of an example, a contemporary example, where perhaps people do what they want and it hasn't ended well for society? Um, riots. Riot. Riots, when people are discontent with the way that the governments might be, well, governments may be running their, their, their countries, for example, absolutely. Situation ethics seems quite ideal. Employ love and things work out for you. However, there are clear limitations. What might they be? I would say that following love can, and it could, it's not good because Let's say in a situation, it was to do the most loving thing would to be to say five people, but your brother was standing there. You want to save your brother, which wouldn't be the most loving thing. As sending five people over, one person would be more loving. But as the most the most loving thing for you would to be to save your brother, and you turn and have a bond. So that links to the point that you said earlier about being subjective. The idea then that serving what serves love to love best 
is then a reliance on the, the, the individual in that situation. Um, and so therefore, the end goal may not necessarily be, may start off with being the, what would be the service that love best, but not necessarily end up being that. We then have the death of five people over the one. Next slide, please, sir. Yeah, just a couple of um, strengths and weaknesses here. A number of these you've already mentioned. Legalism then being clear cut morality uh, would be a strength. Uh, a weakness then being running into problems and addressing contemporary moral issues such as murder, killing, and self defence relies then on. Um, on, on things being situational. Uh, antinomianism then being moral agency, so that's great, you're all kind of responsible for that which you do, so we've got a sense of moral agency going in there, but on the other hand, making moral decisions then as a matter of spontaneity isn't a good thing either for society. Lastly, situationalist is consistent with the teachings of Jesus and the idea that we must love our neighbours, However, on the other hand, love in itself is very subjective and how do we kind of ascertain what is the most loving thing to do? It lies too much in human reasoning, which in itself may be flawed. Last slide, please, sir. So if you're completing the task for the next section, I'd be asking you to consider the following questions. How would legalist, antinomianist and situationist decide on the right course of action when making decisions about theft and lying? So you're applying the theory then to contemporary issues of theft and lying. And the second question then would be, do the strength of situation ethics outweigh its weaknesses? Do the strength of situation ethics outweigh its weaknesses? Both those questions would address the assessment objectives of AO1, knowledge, and AO2, evaluation and critical analysis. Are there any questions for us there? Great, thank you, Miss. Well, then, do you, want to, do you want to come around in front of the camera? That'd be great so people can see you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first, first up, question for the students actually is what do they most enjoy about doing the course? What do you most enjoy about doing the course? Um, I like learning about different ways of like thinking about moral issues, and I like. I personally like application side of it because it puts real life situations in perspective. Yeah. That's I think that it's made me able to be more open minded and seeing other people's perspectives on making moral decisions. I can use that to apply to situations that I may face. Thank you. Are there any other questions, sir? Yeah, there's a um, it's obviously an A level course. Can you just outline the exam? There's no course we have. There is no, yes, that's absolutely right. So there's no coursework attached to this at all. There are two three hour exams, um, but you'll be fully prepared and ready to take on these exams of all the, the work and um, support that's available from, from the team. So, yes, it's a full A level, no exams. Great. Okay, and finally, what sort of subjects are often used in combination with philosophy and ethics, and what do the what are the career paths or university choices of those students going forward? That's a really good question. So many of our students will combine philosophy and ethics with uh, history, English, and sociology is a big one. Um, there are lots of sociological links, um, especially in our Christianity unit. Uh, many students, I think, you all are. Um, so Pressler here takes law and she says that links quite well also and all those students like Salma who have no links whatsoever but just love the concept of learning about philosophy and ethics. Career wise lots of our students will go on to higher education and continue on with philosophy and ethics. Um, many will choose law, uh, social sciences etc. Um, RS is really flexible, philosophy and ethics really flexible. Many students will go off in terms of career paths into the police, social services, and so on and so forth. So it's really diverse in terms of the career paths that you can pursue. Law is another one that's quite um, a lot of students do as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will mute you and uh, thank you for the students for attending as well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next up 
if you want to meet the prefects, you need to jump across to room number one uh, and then back here in 20 minutes for um, our next subject. Thank you.
Hello everyone, business students, wave if you can hear me. Oh, good morning, thank you so much for coming in. Is Miss there? <laughs> Hi Miss, you just need to unmute yourself. Okay, just unmuted us. Lovely, I can hear you now, nice and clear. Should I, I should stand on this side with them or? Yeah, yeah, where you just were, I can see you perfectly, you're in the screen. Okay, so if I... And... Uh, stand here, yeah. Okay, I'll stand here then. Wonderful. And team, can you just say hello so I can see how clear your voices are? Because we've had some issue with students being a bit quiet. Hello. Hiya. Yes, you can always rely on the business students. Fantastic. <laughs> well, we have three non-business students who are really um, helping us out today. So thank you very much. And then oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you're going to be going live in about three-ish, three and a half minutes, OK? Okay. And then I will put myself on mute, um, but I will flick through the PowerPoint for you, Miss. Yeah. Um, so you just have to, to say, ask me to move things on. And then, of course, um, at around about half past 11, sorry, I said a lie, 10 past 11, um, we will switch to Q&A, but if you're overrunning and there aren't any questions, I'll just leave you to carry on. OK, so I'll interrupt and let you know when the questions come in. Miss, can you just talk to me again? I can't hear you. Ah, I can't hear you. Right. Can you? Can you wiggle around with the microphone cable? Because I can't, I've not got any sound. <sighs> Hello, the sound has just gone off in E zero E one oh four. Natasha's looking at the cable, but I'm not getting anything. It's no, they're not on mute. I was literally talking to them 10 seconds ago. OK, I'll do that now. OK, thanks. Hello, Miss, can you hear me? Right, you can hear me, but I can't hear you. I've asked Mr. Fox Joyce to come up and have a look at the mic. Is he there? OK, we're due to go live now, but of course, I'll wait until we've sorted out the sound. Uh, 
Um, it's like 10, oh, oh, that's 10 15 minutes. Oh, really? Oh, I just, I just touched a wire. Is it? <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> So, so can you hear me? So if I if I stand over here, can you still hear me? Oh, okay. Can you still stand over here? Can you still hear me from here then? That's fine. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to keep live. Okay. All right. Going live now. Okay. Um, welcome, Year 11, um, well, future Year 12. My name is Mr. Wufu, and I teach business studies here at Langley. I will be teaching the A level next year. And I've got some students who are here to help me with the lesson today. Miss, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so I want you to have a look at that image over there. And does anybody recognize it? Do you know what happened? At this point, yeah, go ahead. Um, at press conference, he took down the photo which is on the instead. Right, yeah. And do you know how this affected Coke? Then they lose like like millions of pounds in like their share prices. Like, yeah, yes, they did. They lost millions of pounds in their share price. So we're going to talk about the types of promotion that businesses like Coke do, um, and whether or not they're good. So, Miss, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, so yeah, there was a real fiasco with Coca-Cola um, due to Ronaldo's just moving a Coke for all around. Um, so Coke were doing a type of promotion by having their Coke bottles at the Euros. Do you know what that type of promotion is called? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, it's a sponsorship. So sponsorship is when a business will um, pay lots of money and sponsor an event and they will have their brand and their, their items there. Um, can we just take one more time because I've got some questions from that. Okay. Um, so yeah, the form of marketing they were using is sponsorship. So why do you think a business like Coke would use a sponsorship and have their products at a place like this? He's like such a big personality, like if something like someone like him um, like doesn't like a brand or like tries to move it, they'll think, oh, we shouldn't like it either. So like the whole public will think, oh, this is not a good like brand. If he didn't like it, we shouldn't either. So I'm like, I think we're fired. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that um, that really answers the second question. So why Ronaldo has such a big impact on Coke. Um, so yeah, him being such a big personality, I think he's got, he's definitely got millions of followers on Instagram. He's a huge person. But um, even before Ronaldo comes into it, why do you think a business like Coke would sponsor a event like the Euros? Um, they've also, in the past, they sponsored the Olympics, so they were definitely at um, the 2020 Olympics in the UK. Why do you think they would sponsor that event? Go ahead, Savannah. Yeah, so therefore everyone, not just Yeah, yeah, definitely. Everyone's seeing it. Um, it's global. Everyone's seeing it, and they're thinking about Coke, and they're thinking maybe. Maybe I should go and get myself a drink. Um, but you're definitely right. So they are sponsoring the event, not necessarily the person. So the event is going out to lots of people and is getting lots of traction. Everybody's really loving it. But if the person who's there doesn't particularly like the drink or um, does something against it, then it really harms the actual business. So I, I found that um, Coca-Cola's market value plummeted by £2.8 billion pounds after Ronaldo did this, and it actually encouraged some other people to do the same. So someone called Manuel Locatelli, sorry if I'm butchering this, hopefully you know who he is. So apparently he um, paid for Italy, so when Italy was paying for Switzerland, he did something similar, he moved the Coke and was drinking water, and Paul Pogba did something similar with another sponsor of this event, um, they moved the Heineken. So even though the sponsor is such a big event, the people possibly have a bigger impact on what people think of the product. Can we go to the next slide please? But this of course isn't the only way that um, Coke will advertise. Um, do these images ring any bells? Have you seen this before? Yeah. Do you know what type of promotion this is? Do you know what it's called? Product placement. Product placement. Yeah, exactly. So it's when they are just going to place their product 
in a show that we know really well. Um, next clip, please, Liz. So yeah, product placement, oh, it's a bit small, I'll read it out. Um, it's a practice in which manufacturers of goods or providers of services gain exposure for their products by paying for them to be featured in films and television programs. So my question to you guys then is why do you think this might be an effective way to market and are there any drawbacks to doing something like this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it is kind of like subliminal. People don't realise if they like a character's using it, like, oh, I want it, or if they like it, I should like it too. People do that in shows. If someone buys something, they'll automatically think, oh, I will like it too, because the character likes it or the character's using it. Yeah, exactly. We, we grow to love these characters, so yeah, what they're doing really influences our own behaviour. Do you think there could be any possible drawbacks of this method then? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it also depends on how the, the show is portrayed. If that show or that character has some negative press or something, yeah, it could definitely be better. Um, lovely, but yeah, we can definitely still see how that could be an effective way of promotion. Next slide, Karina. And then we have this. What is going on here? What type of promotion are they doing here? So yeah. Yeah, social media. Social media. Now, why is this an effective method of promotion? Go ahead, Yeah, definitely a good point. You can connect with literally everyone. Um, I know that a lot of people are attached to their phones these days, so you'll definitely see it. They've got so many followers that all generations are connected to. So yeah, it's definitely a great way to promote your business. Um, can you think of any other ways that Coke have promoted them? So we've had sponsorship, product placement, um, social media. Any other ways? Can we go to the next one? Yeah, what other types of promotions have you seen them use? Yeah, TV adverts, billboards, yeah. It's like different types of products that they do, like lip balm or like other things to do with it, like merchandise. Yeah, merchandise, yeah, working with other um, businesses, kind of, yeah. Um, even the Tomb Raider, so they're connecting with a, a well known franchise that is out there as well, so that's definitely part of them. So, yeah, there's so many different types of promotion that Coke might use. Which do you think would be the best type of promotion for a business like Coke to use? And why? Yeah? I think um, product placement, because I think it's subliminal. I think when you see something in a show constantly being used, you want to try it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Or even if it's not subliminal and you see your favourite character's favourite drink is Coke, for example, you want to experience that as well. It can be in an obvious way. But I think yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, we definitely love those characters and what they're doing. It's definitely better. Agree, disagree? What do you think? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that association that they've managed to, to do, Christmas equals Coke, and so that's the first thing we're thinking of. Um, so yeah, TV adverts definitely a big part of their promotion. Um, and I don't think there is one best type of promotion, and I think that's why Coke uses such a range of different types, and I think pretty much every business uses such a range of different types. They all work together um, to promote the business um, and have, yeah, and get a lot of customers for that business. So yeah, that's really great. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Miss? I think often when we think of marketing, our mind um, goes straight away to the advertising, the different types of promotion that that business does. But marketing is not just promotion. It also includes market research. The market research is the action or activity of gathering information about consumers, needs, and preferences. 
So, can you tell me any ways that you could gather some market research then? Surveys, like you go like into the public and like ask people like their opinion on their product or anything. Yep, yep, definitely surveys. Um, any others? Yeah, so uh, research is primary and secondary. So can you tell us the difference? Um, one's rolling out and getting the research results. And the other is like going to the government website and taking it from the internet, which is already been there for Lovely, yeah. Primary, getting it yourself, going out and doing it yourself. Like surveys, secondary, it's already been done for you, such as the internet. Um, so why do you think it would be important to gather market research Hand out these surveys, go to the internet, and how could it help a company like Coke? Nice, yes, definitely. Um, so you mentioned qualitative and quantitative data, which are two different types of data. So could you tell us what those mean? Um, one's right, so qualitative data is all opinion based and yet yeah, that helps you find out what people want and their preferences. Quantitative, all numbers and um, statistics based. And so that helps you find out the numbers of people that want a certain thing as well. So yeah, definitely really important. And so obviously you can imagine a business like Coke has done a lot of market research in the past. Can we click one more time, please? So in the 50s, we had the Coca Cola. So in the 1950s, Coca Cola was outselling Pepsi five to one, but by the 80s, Coke had lost its grip on the soda market and only controlled 24% of the market. So the Coca-Cola company had to make a move. Their idea was to come up with a new Coke formula that consumers preferred over both old Coke and Pepsi. So when they would be trying to do this type of this market research to find out information about what people prefer, what sort of things do you think they could have done? What sort of things do you think they could have done? So we know that they were losing their grip on the Coke market by the 1980s. And so they decided that they were going to create a new Coke, um, something that people would prefer over Pepsi. So if they want to create a new recipe, completely new drink, sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, so they want to create a new recipe. They want to create a new drink that people will like, what sorts of market research could they do in order to do this? Yeah? Um, they could do like surveys or focus groups and you can find out like what the service people like and like what could new trends and things like things that they can really Nice focus groups, getting people to taste um, the drink, find out what they like, the flavours, yep, surveys. Anything else you think they could do? And could they get people to like test the flavours like over the like, like trial and error. Yeah, they could do some like taste tests as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Coke definitely did some market research. They tested a new Coke formula on 200,000 people and came up with a drink that beat Pepsi and Old Coke time and time again. So in 1985, they brought it to the market. They stopped making Old Coke. However, the result wasn't quite what they expected. So they found out that consumers actually hated it. So Coca-Cola got 400,000 angry phone calls and letters as Coke drinkers professed their dissatisfaction with the new product. Um, so in less than three months, they pulled the whole drink and um, the old Coke was back on shelves. So how do you think Coca-Cola got it so wrong when doing this market research? Miss, can I can I interrupt and stop you on that really interesting question that I think we're going to have to ask everybody to consider outside of the session only because we've only actually got one minute left for questions and answers oh sorry <laughs> no no that's absolutely fine it's a really engaging lesson i just wanted to make sure that we'd address some of the questions that have come up um if there are any students that you feel can answer these questions then that would be fantastic so the first one um is can i study a level business if i didn't take it for gcse <laughs> yeah. Did any of you guys take um, GCSE? Um, I, 
Oh, okay, and Cassia, you didn't. Okay, so Cassia is living proof. So she's studying business and she didn't take it for GCSE. How are you finding it? Um, you pick it up really easy. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, so the answer to that is no, you don't have to have studied it beforehand. And as long as you meet the entry criteria, we can enroll you. So the next question is, um, will taking business A level help with pursuing a degree in law? A degree in law. Um, so do any of you guys remember learning about Oh, okay. Any like legislation or anything? Oh, so we do a course with Mr. Saunders Whitman where we learn about the law, corporate grants, law, and homicide, and it's really interesting. So it will help you, and it will probably get you to like law a lot more, and it will give you a slight insight as to. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much. And I think we're only going to have time for one more question. I'm sorry, everyone who posted questions. Um, if you would like to contact the teacher directly through the Transition Hub, you can ask those. So a popular question that is coming up is, are there any trips? Um, so I'll take that one. So obviously this year there hasn't been any trips because of COVID, but we are really keen as a department to put some trips on next year. So we've been doing some research and we are really hoping that as long as restrictions are out next year, there will definitely be some trips. OK, brilliant. I think we might be able to squeeze one more in. There's lots of questions about is there coursework? So this is for the A-level um, business. So for the A-level, there won't be any coursework. Um, there is a CTEC option as well, um, which there will be coursework. So if you join that session as well, you'll get some more information about that. OK, wonderful. Right, thank you so much, Year 12. Thank you, Miss. I'm just going to mute you now. I'll answer a couple of the questions in the chat. And uh, have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mrs. Murray Smith, if you can hear me, would you be able to unmute your computer, please? Hi, morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Good. Good. Can I just ask you to budge up your seats just a little bit closer to the microphone, please, because then you will be able to clearly hear your answers. You want to say something so we can see if Miss can hear you? Miss, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. That's excellent. Thank you. OK, it's 20 past. So I'm going to hand over to Mrs. Murray Smith, who is going to deliver the C-Tech business course. 
Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, this session is about the CTEC course. We have two business courses. We have A-level and we have CTEC. And the CTEC course is a vocational course and you can either do the single, which is worth one A-level, or the double, which is worth two A-levels. And it's a mixture of uh, coursework and exams. Okay, we're ready to get started. So our topic for today, what we're looking at is can you suggest how an organisation, how a business should manage change? That's what we're going to be looking at. And the thing that I want you to think about first of all is I want you to imagine that the school decided to change the school uniform. I don't mean the dress code for the sixth one, I mean the uniform lower down. What do you think the reaction would be? And why? And who's reacting? So give me some suggestions. Okay, so um, first of all, I think it's the parents, because the parents are obviously going to have to pay for the new uniform, it's going to take out costs which they have to prepare for, and it's going to affect them a lot. You know, it's not so much because they're just wearing it, everyone's going to look the same, but the parents will have to find the money and then. Okay, so Savannah's given us reasons why they're going to react. If I pass it up to you to how do you think they're going to react? Um, what do you think they're going to do? Okay, so you're saying that they may react. That will come to some theory that we're going to look at in a minute. What do you think? Um, I feel like parents would like call up the school and complain, or students might really up the top if they don't want to wear anything. Thank you. So if Miss Scott said, right, the uniform is changing from maybe next week. From next week we're changing the uniform. Well, how are the students going to react? Because you've heard about parents, how do you think the students are going to react? She announces it in an assembly. What happens after that assembly? What do you imagine the students here will be doing? Gossiping? Yeah, what would they be saying? They want to know how it looks. Obviously, they're, they the most are going to want to know about everything because they're the ones. Okay. So they want some information. Good. Would they be complaining? Would they go, oh, new uniform, next week that's fine? They probably would be complaining. Okay, so if we now, so we're now going to look at the theory of how you should manage that change. So, Miss, if you could, so the, um, the reality is that if you are changing something in a business, people will resist it because, for two reasons, they either are scared of change or they don't like being told to change. We would call that being top down. If you get top down changes, people resist it. They push back against those changes. Why would that happen? Why do you think people resist change, fear change, don't like being having change imposed on them? Uh, is it because they've been used to something for so long and then having someone come and change something to them is it's the reason that it's the reason why they don't really need it. So we'll hang on to that. They don't see the need. That's a really good point. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Fantastic. So they don't understand. They haven't been involved. Great stuff. So now we'll look at the theory. So if we go on to the next slide. But you're already anticipating the theory. So we have, there are lots of theories of change management. The one that I particularly like, because I think it's sort of quite um, easy to, to understand, is Lewin. So Lewin's theory is that you have to start, if you are introducing change in a business, you have to start by unfreezing people's attitudes. The next stage will be, you have to think about how you're going to carry out your change, how you're going to implement it. And finally, you have to do what he calls refreezing, which is thinking about how you're going to make sure your change sticks. So we'll stick with the idea of the uniform. Let's think about unfreezing. So you're the head teacher. You've decided you want to change the uniform. What kind of things might you do to change people's attitudes so that they don't have this big emotional reaction? Yeah. Fantastic. So I don't know if you heard that at home, but actually explaining to people, right, you're thinking behind it. And what would be the impact of explaining this is what we're doing and why? What do you think? Because it gives them the information they want, they're going to know what's, what's going to happen. Like, no one likes being left in the dark, so someone being told what's going to happen is going to be their mind. 
you should start going to leadership view. This is fantastic. You are understanding instinctively what you need to do. And many people who lead businesses do not. Um, anything else that you might do apart from Ella, anything you might do apart from explaining the reasons and the need for the change? Remember we said head teacher is going to change uniform next week. How might you do that a bit differently? Um, Perfect. Because then you give people time to get used to something. Remember, we're trying to change people's attitudes. Give them more time. So you involve them and you've explained. Fantastic. Go to the second stage, changing. Once you've given them all that time and you've involved them, maybe you've consulted them on what should be the uniform. How would you then go about carrying out the change? How do you think you'd you've got your stage where you have made your decisions but you need to make sure that people know kind of what it is you've decided. I've um, never been over a period of time so not rushing straight into it. You can, if you gradually do it over time and let people get used to it then they'll follow up. Fantastic, this is absolutely what the theory would say. If you can build up to something gradually That'd be much better. In the, in the school, are there people that you would involve with in the change? Yeah. Students, you're going to involve the students. All students, some students? That's like when we have prefects, so there's a selector and they talk on behalf of the other students so that they're able to see more clearly. Fantastic. They're going to have representatives from, from different, uh, different year groups. So we've consulted, we've explained, we've involved people, we've changed the uniform. What would you do to make sure the change sticks? Now for our example that means making sure people wear the uniform. Ella, anything that you would do to make sure they keep wearing the uniform? Good, because otherwise what would happen? People, the change wouldn't stick. You've got to do something to enforce it. So that people get used to the change. Anybody? Is there anything else anybody else is going to do to refreeze? You've done really well. Let's have a very quick look at the theory, and then we'll be ready for questions and answers. So if we go to the next slide, and it is quite small, but I wanted you to see how this is the deed and how much of this you did. So. The unfreezing is educating, informing, consulting, planning, all of those things you came up with without even knowing the theory. Implementation, we didn't really talk about how we might praise people. Well done, you've got the new uniform. Um, encouraging people, um, making sure that people are very clear maybe on what the new uniform is because sometimes things are not well communicated and then people don't follow the change because you didn't explain it to them properly. They haven't understood it. Um, provide adequate resources. So make sure that actually the uniform is affordable. Have you supported the people you know, to buy the uniform? Those kinds of things. The refreezing, um, absolutely monitor the uniform strikes. So checking that people are doing what it is you've asked them to do and or rewarding people who are doing, because you talked about sanctions, which is right, but also reward people. Well done, you've got the new uniform. Um, and expect that there'll be maybe a, peer, a, a period of time that people adjust. So fantastic. Started with what you already knew. We've got you already were able to work out some really practical solutions. We've had a quick look at the theory. And now we are ready for questions. Thank you for that, everybody. And I'm really, really pleased to hear the um, mention of the prefects and the use of student leadership to help drive new initiatives and change forward. So thank you very much for that contribution. So we do have a few questions um, in the chat. This first one will be for Mrs. Murray Smith. What is the difference between a B tech and a C tech for business? Oh, that's a really good question. First of all, welcome for spotting that we've moved from B tech to C tech. B 
The difference is it's a different exam board and we think the resources are better and their systems, but really there isn't much difference. But there are, I suppose, a fundamental difference is that we think it is a better resourced course in that there's, you know, we like the books um, and we like the units, but otherwise no real difference. No real difference for you, difference for us in terms of administration um, but otherwise it's the same thing but it's run by a different exam board so we've just switched exam boards for the same course that's wonderful thank you miss so um, another question is outside of covid restrictions what are there any opportunities for visits and trips i think that's a really important question for me as a teacher I think teaching business and just keeping you in the classroom, it sort of makes no sense. You need to go and visit business because we haven't done that this year. Um, we have somebody who in the department who is busy researching trips. If you were in the last presentation, you'd have seen Ms. Rosso, uh, and one of her targets for next year is to plan some extracurricular activities and to actually get you into businesses. One thing we do very well here, though, is we have so the businesses come to you in the, um, our careers advisor every week will be arranging for um, business people to visit us virtually and talk to students about their career. That's brilliant. Yes, and, uh, and thank you for raising our careers advisor. We really do have a very supportive careers advisory service here at Langley. Um, uh, what, the next question is, can you advise any particular subjects that complement the CTEC business course? Oh, right. So if you do the single course, then you can choose two other A-levels. If you do the double, then you're only choosing one A-level. People that choose the double tend to be people that are really focused in that they know they want to do a business degree. Um, a lot of students do business and law. Um, What's your other subjects? Photography. Um, lots of students in the school study psychology. A lot study sociology. So really, I think it's I think it should be about what is it that you're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Can I just ask a question to the students then? Um, what do you most enjoy about learning about business? Oh, the students here. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I would say is that you can understand things from a different perspective, and you could use it in your everyday life on what you learn. And if you're looking to become more encouraging and confident, I'm pretty confident this would be a subject you choose to help you get yourself out there more. Because me, I used to be really shy, but I, I know that business helped me develop my skills in communication. And that's um, Savannah's doing the double course, whereas Ella's doing the single. So you probably have a, you have a slightly different perspective. It's quite similar because you can like take what you learn and use it like outside of school. And if you don't then go ahead to do like a business degree or something similar, you can still use what you have learned. Here's a question for you. How have you found balancing? Because the A levels, obviously, they're having all of their exams at the end of two years, but you're having really important assessments throughout year 12. How have you, have you got any thoughts on what's that, what that's like for students? Um, I feel like it's a lot better doing like some exams in year 12 instead of them all at the end of year 13 because there's less to like revise to worry about. And it's like one of my exams just lifted off the shoulders. And I think the other thing with the CTEC is that you get a sense of how you're progressing. So you're building up your grade as you work through the course. Yes, absolutely. And we have one final question. Thank you so much, students. They were really helpful answers. One final question for you. Are there similar topics in the CTEC business that will have been studied at GCSC business? Some of them are completely different. Business, we would call it a spiral curriculum because business is business. So in business, you always have marketing. In business, you always have finance. You always have human resources. So 
you would find if you did a GCSE, you'd have those topics, and at A level you would do those, or a CTEC, and at a degree you would do those. What I really like about the CTEC course and the BTEC course is that you have those core things that are just fundamental for business, but you have some extras. So, for example, um, you'll do some event planning. You won't have done that at GCSE. Mm -hmm. So you'll be some of the topics will be familiar, but they'll be going to a deeper level. So if you've done the GCSE, that will be a good starting point, but you're not disadvantaged if you haven't. And then there'll be some units which are just completely new. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, um, everybody that's joined as well for those excellent questions. And um, I hope you're finding the day useful. Prefects and uh, and Year 12, thank you for coming in and supporting with the session too. And uh, have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you. Hello everyone. Sir, could you unmute your computer? Okay, yeah. Can you hear us? That's now? wonderful, thank you. How are you all? All right, I think, hopefully. Yes. 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 Okay, so your session is going to start in two minutes. Yep. And I am going to push the um, the PowerPoint on, so you just need to let me know when you want me to move the slide forward. Yep. Uh, the aim being that you will have finished the taught element at around 11.50, so that we've got five minutes for questions. And students, some of those questions I will aim at you because obviously year 11 really value hearing your perspective. Is that okay? Yeah, so I can later on. Okay, okay. So I'm going to mute myself and um, we'll go live in about a minute. Okay. No, it's literally just going to be into like questions. Well, I asked for the point, I'm going to explain that. <laughs> I'm not just going to get you go back. Okay, go ahead. We got it, everybody got it wrong, and we were completely stupid. There's nothing really like that. Nothing to the cat, Okay, good afternoon. Uh, not afternoon, not yet. It's still morning. It's still morning. Got 20 minutes. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining um, to attend the computer science session. I am going to hand over to Mr. Brooks and our year 12 students to, and please do type any questions in the chat as they occur to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss. So we can have the first slide. Okay, so we're just going to do a quick little session on compression today. Um, so looking at what compression is and 
being able to do a little bit of uh, run length encoding, which is a way of reducing file sizes. Okay, so I'm gonna, you've got a sheet in front of you, and I'm, it's on the next slide as well. There's a little diagram that I'd like you to try and figure out how they've calculated this to be 32 bytes. So if you move it on, oh, yeah, that's the one. Um, so the question, how has that file size been calculated to be 32 bytes? So just as a clue, there's 16 across and there's 16 down on that page there. So how do you think they got to the fact that there's 32 bytes? And obviously remembering that 32, um, it's eight bits in a byte. Okay, so just give me a second. How would you, I mean, you, you haven't got calculators with you. So if you just want to tell me how you would do it rather than actually calculating that number, that's okay as well. Go on, yeah. Um, so since uh, there's eight bytes, uh, eight bits in a byte, um, and then it'd be 16 by 16. Yeah. Um, since there's 16 in a row, divide that by two, and then um, the 16 row times that by 16. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Yeah, that's one. Um, Kira, I see you guys slightly differently. Um, How did you do? Because there's 16 rows and 16 columns, I just times 16 by 16 and then divide that by 8. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically 16 by 16. So that grid has got 256 bits in it. There's 8 bits in a byte. So divide it by 8 and you get 32 bytes. So, if you could move on then, please. Thanks. Um, there's a hint, we didn't need a hint. So that little picture then, so we needed 32 bytes to store that picture. So compression is all about reducing the size of the file. Why do we need to kind of reduce the size of the files? Yes? Good, that's one thing, so it's easier to transfer. What's another sort of big one why you want to get yes. safe storage? Yes, absolutely. So it reduces the size the storage, because of your phones, if you think about that, you've only got limited space computers, so you want to reduce the size of these files. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at, how we can reduce the size of that little picture we have by using some run length encoding. So if we go to the next slide then, please, next. So if we look at that picture again, it's got kind of, if you were to break that down, you could think of it as being the whites ones and the blacks are zeros, okay? So we've seen already that it's 32 bytes, because of the, the storage of that grid. So if you can move on again, one more story this. Um, on that page is a table, and you've got it on the rear side of your sheet as well, on the second page, on the right-hand side. So you, what you can do is you can break that down into run lengths. So how many times a single color, or a single number in this case, appears. So you have to go from left to right, and you keep working down the rows, basically. So that first one, as you can see there, it says it's 34. So it's 16, second row is 16, then we've got two more, so that's 34 bits, okay, white. We then flip to black, and we've got four blacks. So in that table on the right-hand side, you can see, you can say, it, it being changed into a table of lists of numbers. So, which is the longest run of single color? You can look at that table, you don't need to necessarily count them. It's on the second page because it's a bit smaller on your screen. Right? Uh, yeah, what's the biggest number? Uh, 42. 42. Okay, so that's the biggest number we basically we've got to represent. We can have the next slide, please. Yes. Sorry, can we have the next slide? Yeah, okay, thanks. And the next one, sorry. Here we go. So, just a very quick binary recap. Um, Finally, it's obviously powers of two along the top there. So we've got one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on. If we want to represent a number, like we have here, or we want to calculate that number, we've got the binary number 00100010. That is equal to 34. And to get 34, what you've done is just look at the columns that have got a one in it and just add them up. So 32 plus 2 is 34. Okay. So we've saying that we need 42 to be represented. So how many bits would you need of that byte, there's eight bits in that byte, how many would you need to represent the number 42? In total, okay, the whole length. Obviously there's three ones, but how far across would that go? So we needed, for example, looking at 34, you would need six bits to do that, because you can knock off the 64 128, you don't need them. So if you're doing 42, how many would you need to do that as well? Six, oh, yeah. 
So we need six, and that's, there we go, six bits for our 42. Okay, so next slide, please, Miss. Okay, so we're saying we need six bits for, in order to store each of those runs at the maximum, basically. So, with that in mind, how many bytes are you going to need to store this picture now if we're using six bits for each one? Little hit, little hit on there. So there's 25 different row, rows in that table or runs of colour. How would you work out how many bits? Well, how many bytes? So you might initially work out how many bits that is, and then calculate how many bytes that might be. Okay, so have a quick Again, if some of those big numbers, those numbers are relatively big, if you want to just tell me the calculation you would do rather than the actual number. Not eight. How many? Twenty-five times six. Yeah, it's the first bit. What does that equal to? What's twenty-five times six? Hundred and fifty. Good. What would we then do with that hundred and fifty to get it into bytes? Divided by eight. Yeah. Good. So. I'm not expecting you to do that. If you would like to see the answer to this, we just click on a couple of. Did we see the answer to this? Sorry. If you click on this. Sorry, sir. I've got a lag from my screen. Uh, I'm clicking uh, on Send Live. It's not transferring across to you. I don't know why. Okay. Well, basically, so yeah, it's 150 divided that by eight. That is equal to, I think, 17.75. Well done, yes. Better math than I <laughs> So, in other words, we're going to need 19 bytes to store that file now. Okay. So, what do we, how many did we say we needed to start with when we had the original picture? 32. So, we're now down to, we say, 19. So, how many bits have we saved? With the maths? Thirteen, yeah. <laughs> so we have reduced the file size by thirteen bits by encoding it by instead of storing every single bit, we just stored it a strings of numbers, um, and we print almost half the size of that file by doing that. Okay. And obviously, then if you start thinking about the bigger scale, we can start to shrink um, bigger files in that case. So just to kind of sum up, I don't know if we can get off the last question on the screen. If we go to the last slide. Okay, I'll ask the question anyway. So what was it, do you think, about that image that we had that lent it to being able to produce the size so well, or being able to use the bundle encoding with that picture? Why did it work so well? Yes. Uh, it's repeated bits. Uh, repeated bits, yeah, and it's quite basic, isn't it? So we've only just got the ones and the zeros, and it's very blocky, so it's quite simple, but that allows it to be quite good for encoding this because we can just do those long streams of numbers. What situation might it not work quite so well with? Yes, why would that be? Because it has more to it, it's Absolutely, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so if you've got a really high resolution picture, lots of um, colours, lots of things going on with it, you're unlikely to get quite so many streams of one colour all in one row, okay? which is going to mean it's not going to be able to reduce that size quite so well. Okay. And there we have it. Okay, so that's, I think, our time. So is there any questions? In the yes, there are questions. I'm really sorry to everybody who's joined, and I'm sorry to Sir for his, his lesson looks fantastic. We've had bad network quality errors coming up, so it hasn't allowed the PowerPoint to transfer across. But I can see the questions, so should we do the questions? Um, yeah, one of the questions that then. seems to be quite popular today is, do you need to have studied either IT or computing at GCSE level in order to take it at AA level? So it was breaking up a lot and it didn't really catch up. So I can't hear you at the moment. Mm 
Did you hear that question, sir? Uh, no, so we can't hear anything, we're very sorry. Yeah. I'll try it again. Can you study A level computing if you haven't studied it at GCSE? Yes, you can, absolutely. Um, we do have one student this year and we have students at other years. Um, it's a little bit more catching up because obviously the GCSE does, um, the, well, the A level follows on from the GCSE. But yeah, it doesn't mean you can't do it, absolutely. It might be slightly more work, but it's absolutely doable, yeah. Okay, so one of the other questions is, can you can you estimate a percentage of overlapping content between the GCSE and the A level? Ooh. Yeah, I would say 60 ish percent. Um, then a lot of the topics then kind of go further on. So they have kind of the same sort of base to it and then they'll go a little bit further. But yeah, there is there is quite a significant overlap. You know, yeah, yeah, I think these were agreeing at sort of 60, 70 percent almost. Okay. And it's a little bit more complex. So it's that. perfectly possible to catch up if you haven't if you haven't studied computer science at GCSE, so long as you've met the entry requirements in terms of science and maths. Absolutely, yeah. So say so we do have students every year that have done it. OK, wonderful. Uh, another question is typically what universities do people go on to, to if they want to study computer science, what are the most popular university destinations? Um, I don't think there's any particular one. There's been a little over the place. There's one we're going to Bath this year. Um, quite a few of the London ones, Imperial. Um, we have one flying to Oxford as well. So this the year, so that it all, yes, it, that, it can be, but all, equally, I say this. It, it's not always because some, some of the other universities do do quite some good computer science courses as well. So it's not always just the traditional ones. But it's hard to say, yeah, okay. the typical one. Lovely, thank you. Um, and if, if, I, if I get a, a good grade in computing but not so good in maths, am I still able to study it for A level? So was that a good one in computing and not such a good one in maths, was it? That's right, yes. Um, yes, again, obviously maths is quite important, but it's not the, the only part of the course. Um, how, how much maths would you say you, you need? Well, I think it's quite simple maths. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, it's linked to maths in terms of the logic involved in it, but it's not really technical maths so that is why we kind of ask for sort of level six with maths or the computer science level six as well really so yes it's, it helps i think in terms of logical thinking but it's not yeah it's not like it's heavy maths on the course so yeah so it, you can still do it. wonderful thank you sir and one final question um do we need to complete transition work to be accepted onto the course Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know, Miss. You might be a good one to answer that as well. But I think obviously it gives, <laughs> gives us a good indication of your um, of your enthusiasm for the course and you and wanting to. Yeah. Um, I would. I would agree. I would support that. It's I a good think indication you... of this. We've got open Yes, I mean, ultimately we do have a maximum class size and if it comes down to selecting between one student who you know, with exactly the same grades who as who is, is currently an offer holder and one who has completed the transition from one who hasn't, then obviously the transition work is another layer of criteria that we can use to allocate the spaces. So whilst it's not compulsory, it really does help us to do it, differentiate and also you will just begin your course in a much, much stronger position if you have completed that work than if you haven't. Absolutely, and all the, all the transition work I have set is all very relevant to, to helping you to start the course. It will only put you in a better position. And uh, one more and then I'll do it down and I do apologise to everybody else who submitted questions. Please do contact via the Transition Hub 
um, if you would like your questions answered further and you can't find the answers. I can see that some of the questions are what's the exam board and obviously that information is on our website. Um, so the last one I'm going to go for is typical class size. Um, at the moment we've got 14, so yeah, between 10 and 20 it's kind of roughly. But uh, yes, we, we start, it's looking like we might have quite a few next year, hopefully. So yeah, it really depends. But roughly, yeah, 15-ish, I'd say. Okay, thank you so much, students. Thank you so much, sir. Sorry to everybody about the um, connection glitch and uh, we will be posting these transition PowerPoints onto the hub so you'll be able to access them and catch up if it wasn't clear. OK, thank you, everybody. Thank you. You feel like in a studio and it's like you've got people in the background with the cameras going, okay, lights, camera, action. Hello everyone. Can you wave if you can hear me? Give us a wave. Hi. <laughs> um, sir, just to make you aware, Poor Mr. Brooks just had his um, computer computing session and Teams just went into bad connection mode and wouldn't allow, I think it's, I don't know why, I think something's going on across the school, it's happening in all the sessions. At the moment it seems to be working fine, but it's just a word of warning that um, if that happens, I will let you know. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Miss. Uh, okay, so we're going to go. Um, we're going to go live in one minute. I will move the slide on for you as and when you request it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Ashman Clark. No problem. So I'd just like to welcome Mr. Clark and our Year Twelve sociologists to deliver the taster session on sociology. Mm -hmm. Please do put your questions in the chat as the session goes on. Thank you very much. 
Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mr. Clark, as, uh, and I'm the head of sociology here, as, as Mrs. has pointed out. It's lovely to have you all here with us virtually today to get a bit of a taster as to what sociology is all about. Some of you might be doing it at GCSE, but for some of you, it might be a brand new subject. So we're going to give you um, a bit of a taster as to what it's all about. And who you can see here now, you've got Ash, you've got Gabby, and you've got Eloise here. And we're going to go through some of the kind of ideas that we, we study in sociology. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ashman Clark. Could you pop the first slide on now, please? Hello? It might be this technical issue. <laughs> it might be. Can you see it? No, not yet. Not yet. Oh dear, it's, it's happening again. Oh, uh, no worries. We, we'll just have a debate about um, the issues. So for everyone at home, what we did this morning... Oh, oh fantastic. There we go. And Miss, could you, could you click the button twice, please? talk about this. Um, I'm sorry for the, those of you at home, we have a 747 aeroplane flying overhead there by the sounds of things. So what we have here, this is uh, an idea by a man named James Truslow Adams and he talked to um, the Americans about the American dream and the American dream is this idea that if you put all your effort into your life, if you work hard, if you study hard, then you can achieve anything you want. And so this picture here is all the items that you can actually obtain if you work really, really hard. Now, the question I have for my sociology students here is, does everyone have an equal chance, an equal opportunity to do as well as they possibly can in society? So, where am I going to go first? Okay, we're going to go to Gabby. Thanks, Gabby. Um, so I think that class plays a big role in, you know, yeah. achieving everything. And some people in lower classes may not have access to the same resources that people in the upper class would have. Excellent. So they might not achieve the same things as the upper class would. Superb. Right. Anyone else? Go for Eloise. Um, like streaming and something not amazing. Excellent. So like teachers label and stream like. Usually the working class students with the lower sets of like labels, whether they just start to get high sets, they get maybe because of the resources they get. Yeah. Um, I can afford. Um, and if the students given a negative label, then they might, then the person who might happen, and yeah. they might have to leave, and that negative label is true. Wow. They might achieve that. Yeah, go for it. Gabby's going to have some more. Go for it. I just, you know, she reminded me also, it, it, um, it links in with the that working class peoples have, yeah. that they're, you know, they're less able than the working class students to achieve everything yeah. that yeah. they that's brilliant and for those of you at home who are who are watching this what we have here and um, we've got two factors that we look at we look at things that happen outside of the classroom uh, it could be poverty it could be disadvantage you could be disadvantaged in terms of employment and also things that could occur in the classroom which means that some people really um, don't go as further in life as they they want to go they become disadvantaged by the system. So here in sociology, what we want to do is try and weigh up um, the pros and cons of different things that can really affect us in a positive and negative way. Right, what we're gonna do now, Miss, could we go on to the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. And Miss, could you tap it four times for the animation? So what we um, have coming up on the screen here, for those of you listening at home, um, we look at crime and deviance um, in year 13. And, and this is a really fascinating unit, which it, we try to get to the bottom of what society decides as being a crime and are there changes over time? It's what we call um, social construction. Is it society that decides whether or not something is going to be a crime? And so we've got some interesting facts here. The first one, um, it was once legal to cane a student until 1986, and it was called corporal punishment. 
Um, we also have um, uh, guillotine here, and that was actually the method of execution in France until 1977, which was the final public execution. It's actually illegal to handle a salmon in a suspicious manner. And, and that is a law from 1986, not 1886 or 1786. That is a law from 1986 and to carry a plank on a pavement. So, Miss, just one more time, please. And I've got the question coming up on the screen that everyone can look at. That's great. Thank you very much. So how does society decide what is isn't a crime? Are we socialised to commit crime? Or is it biological? Or is it a mix of socialisation and biology? What do we think, Ash? Start us off. Um, I think we are socialised to commit crime because mm -hmm. we're not being taught yeah. It's about like, what society says is a crime. Right. Maybe society could be a crime but in a different culture yeah. not that's interesting so what i should say here is that it's about we don't we are socialized um through many different methods to decide whether or not something is a crime which is a really interesting idea gabby Eloise? Um, yeah. yeah um i think society decides whether it's a crime like if it's dangerous or to harm other people yeah. or harm themselves yeah um, that's kind of, yeah. Like you said earlier, if it makes them feel safer. Very good, very good. Yeah, go for it, Kevin. Um, kind of like Ash said, how we aren't born with the instinct to commit crime, we mm. aren't born with the instinct of survival. Wow. So deciding if something is a crime is very, it's not quite difficult as a society, but it's about experience and what we experience. Mm. And all it takes is one person to go through an unsafe experience, yeah. and then all of society has that instinct preserve itself to the human population. Right, that's that's a really interesting point. Preservation. So is it that society collectively decides it, it wants to keep people safe? And so morally it could be the case that people decide this is an action which is deviant. And so therefore we want to make sure that people follow the social norms of society and uh, you know keep tra traditional in in forms of behavior on many occasions anything else folks about this no that's good okay let's uh, next slide please miss ashman clark okay the next slide which will be coming on shortly and i think we've got a few uh, technical uh, difficulties here we also look at um culture and beliefs and we look at um, the slide itself is about an island, a Greek island called Kefalonia. And in Kefalonia, they have a tradition every August thing where a, a saint is passed over um, people. They take him out of this old church, they pass him over some people, and they're waiting um, for miracles. They want to be healed. And so even in today's world, we have people who, who believe in spirituality. They believe there's something else out there. It might not be a scientific explanation. And so we look at the power of belief. And so my question for everyone here is, are people becoming more religious, less religious, religion changing form? What do you think? Ash. I think um, bad is happening. People turn to religion, like more people turn to religion. For example, like this year, um, with like COVID, yeah. there's probably more people have become religious, like yeah. just to believe in something that suddenly you get better. Right, very good. Society, a lot of people. Um, you know, they they have a hunger for meaning, and with everything that's happened in the last year and a half. Um, there's a, a little um, animation that could come on the screen shortly. It's a lot of research at Christmas found that teenagers have actually become more religious. There it is. Thank you, Miss. And that's in the Times newspaper. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Ash. Elise? I think that people are more educated in terms of religion. Right. I learned about it in school, yeah. like three or five, like people are more diverse, so you can learn about it. Yeah. Really yeah. I think mean, like there are people who are like atheists who live in the same thing. Yeah. And they're able to like put their opinions because where it used to be very, very religious, many people 
Right. That's a really good point. You see, there was only one main religion of the country and people would not speak out. They probably didn't know about other religious ideas, but now we have a lot more diversity. And what we do here in sociology, we try and link it with other um, A levels. So we can link this with philosophy and ethics. We can link it with globalization in a geography A level too. So we can see that patterns of beliefs might be changing over time in society as we become more aware of what's out there, like a, a religious market, so to speak. Gabby, yeah. Yeah, I was um, going to say how, like Elise said about atheism, atheism yeah. yeah, um, that it's like, before it wasn't really accepted to not believe in anything, yeah. but now we have more knowledge of the world and science and these kind of things. And so it's really about knowledge. And the yeah. more knowledge you have, the more diverse you have. Yeah. yeah. So before, when they only knew one thing, that's what everybody deemed as acceptable, yeah. and that's what everybody had to follow. That's brilliant. Well done. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, um, all three of you. Now we've got um, time for questions and answers, Miss. We do, and uh, I'm. So thank you for your patience, and I'm so sorry okay. about uh, about the technical hitches. We uh, we think it's a Teams issue as opposed to a school issue. So how we resolve that, I do not know. But I can hear you now, and um, and I've got some really good questions yeah. in the chat. So the first question is. How is sociology different to psychology? So I don't know if, if any of you study both and you'll be able to explain that. Would you, want, would you like to explain that one? Yeah. Um, I think psychology is mostly understanding the biological way that, this, that people function and sociology is the way that people function within society. Brilliant, brilliant answer. Yeah. Uh, it's more to do like individual people um, rather than like as a society. Excellent, right. So the, the kind of um, the, the idea there, psychology can focus on the kind of like the perspective of the individual, not all the time, because when we look at social psychology, it does get close to sociology as a as a subject in of its own right. Sociology is mainly about how society affects us, whereas psycho psychology is mainly about how we perceive and understand the world. OK, Miss? That's wonderful. Thank you. My next question is, where can sociology A level take me in terms of university or a career? What's interesting about sociology and what I personally love about sociology is it's on the up. It's increasingly recognised as being an extremely valuable subject at A level. Um, we've got several of our previous students, Miss, and you'll testify to this who've um, taken positions at Cambridge and, and Durham as a result of taking sociology A level. Um, a sociology is one of those what I call link subjects because sociology is about society. It gives you chance over two years of studying it to think about how the world affects you. And as a result of that, my students go on to university and they study things like criminology because they've done crime and deviance. They go and do things like international development because they've they become concerned about issues of injustice that we we raise in in this course. I've got um, students who are going to be uh, midwives. They're going to be social workers, uh, probation officers. It's a real people persons kind of a level. It gives you chance just to reflect on who you are, and your position in society, and where you want to go next. Oh, Miss, you're just a little bit. We can't hear you now, actually. At all. No, I can't hear. It's the mic. There's something wrong with the mic there, I'm afraid. No, I'm afraid we can hear just to say discern your voice. I don't know if you can hear us. Is there a question you could write in the chat? Um, I, while you're doing this, Miss, uh, I mean, I love teaching this subject. It's extremely popular here at Langley and it's um, a subject which you can, if you have a sense of ownership, if you fall in love with um, what's wrong in the world and you want to understand more about 
who you are and how the world affects you and what you can do about it. For me, you are learning uh, an A level um, while you're learning about yourself. And obviously I'm going to be biased because I love my own subject, but I just think it's a, a perfect subject for um, figuring out how the world works. It really works alongside law as an A-level um, because we look at the criminal justice system. It works alongside geography as an A-level because we look at globalisation. Um, it works alongside religious studies, psychology, health and social care. Um, because sociology is about the world, so you, you're going to uh, link in with different A-levels. And the great thing about linking in with the different A-levels is we link in with them at exactly the same time um, of the specification. OK, Miss, we can't hear you at all. Yeah, can't. Uh, oh, Miss is typing. OK, let's have a look. Yes, we can see the chat. We're good with the chat. Yeah, go for it, please. Yes, please. Um, I think it's really interesting because obviously, you, you want to, I, I don't know, I really like learning about the world and how it works. And you learn about education, and obviously, we're in education right now, and you can kind of see it sometimes happening, and it's quite interesting. That's can excellent. <laughs> yeah, OK, I'll do this super sharpish. Yes, we have three exams. It's very much a written based subject. I'm sorry for those of you. It's not just the debating. You can see the faces of my students here. It's, it's actually writing. There's 20 and 30 mark essays. But you know what? We all want a challenge in this life. And you learn some great writing skills through doing this. An A level, unfortunately, stands for advanced level, but it's going to really put you in a good stead for university. Three exams at the end of the course, each two hours long, very similar to the rest of the A level subjects that we have here at Langley. Do you want to add anything, Gavin? Yeah, I, I think that essays get easier with time. Yes. And, you know, I, I love sociology and I like like writing about it. So when I know what I'm writing about, it kind of goes by quickly. Yes. I just want to put my ideas down and it's, I don't see the time pass by and I don't feel yeah. the pain. <laughs> so there you go everybody. <laughs> like it so much, eventually you don't feel the pain, you become immunised to the pain. Right, let's see, one more question. There we go. Thank you very much for listening and tuning in. Sorry about the technical issues folks, but we hope you gleaned enough there. Any questions, jcl at lpgs.bromley.school.uk. Take care folks. Thank you very much everybody. <laughs>
Hello, Miss. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Ah, that's amazing. Okay, so word of warning, Teams is having some network connection issues. Um, and so we've uh, it's, we've had some issues with dropping in and out in terms of sound and also in being able to move on the PowerPoint slide. Um, so I'm just going to I'm just giving you that as advance warning, but I'm hoping um, can you see? Yes, yeah, see, I'm having trouble now moving on the history slide. Mr. Webb's joined okay. us, so he's going to try it from his end. Okay. I'm trying to take over. Are we okay to go? Oh, here we go. I was taking over. He just took over. Okay, right. All right, we'll kick start then. So welcome to the history sessions, the A-level history. Um, I'm introduce you to two uh well one is a history student one is a <laughs> but very kindly is offered to help so can you introduce yourselves for the camera um i'm aziza i do history <laughs> i'm gabby i don't but i do sociology and i think it's a little similar yes and there'll be yeah. really that's a really good point gabby that there'll be really strong crossovers with other subjects um so it's a it kind of it's one of the reasons why you should do history because it does link to a lot of subjects such as sociology, psychology, law and politics as well. So what we'll do is run through what kind of lesson we would have and debates that we'd have at A-level history and then we'll take questions at the end. So I'm going to show you two sources on the next slide and I want you two to basically tell me what do you think the message is of each source. So I might say, for example, Zizi, you could do one, Gabby, you could do another. And we've just been joined by Sade, another one of our fantastic A-level students who's going to help out as well. So, so could you move on to the next slide then? Yeah, we got there. Right. So this, as we have just said, we're going to start looking at and debating um, capitalism versus communism and this idea of which one system is more viable than the other. One of the things that we would talk about um, and just stress when we are teaching as well is that you understand all of the terminology. Is there any word up there that you might go that means that, that I need that just explain to me or anything like that? What does, okay, so I'll put it out to you. What does viable mean? Okay, so you can use it. Right, so it kind of fits what that society needs. Okay, it's important. Okay, so we've got this idea it's useful, it's important, it fits the society. Um, if they want to use communism or capitalism. So just have a quick discussion between yourselves and if you can discuss quite loudly so they can hear it on the camera as well. Um, what do you think the source on the left where it says Comrade, Comrade Lenin, Russian communist leader, cleanses earth of filth by Victor Denny in November 1920 and then the source on the right, what do you think is meant by that? Okay, so what is the message of both sources? So have a discussion and then you can feed back to me. Um, so there, um, you want to do the left one? Yeah. Um, um, well, it says cleansing the earth of filth, but you see him 
sweeping people. Mm. Yeah, so I think what it is is this is showing um, communism in a positive light mm. because um, it's cleansing the earth of that capitalist ideology kind of thing that is like a parasite type of thing. It's like a illness that needs to be cleansed. So that's what communism is going to do. Right. So what? So you both. We, all of you together have got the message of both sources perfectly. So the one on the left is the idea of communism being as a good thing. It's getting rid of certain nasty elements within society. And then on the right, the idea of communism being seen as a predator, that it's reaching its claws into other parts of the world. What, if I go back to the first source on the left, what is it trying to clean up in particular? Or what kind of corruption exists within different parts of society? Can you see it? I can see like a thing. Yeah. It's like like aristocracy. Yeah. Good. Well done. So the students have observed that there's a king there, so that's the idea of getting rid of you know people with an enormous amount of um, wealth and power. So that would be the royal family in particular. I don't know. Like religion. Fantastic. So yes, if you see at the bottom of the broom, there's a priest. So it's getting rid of the priest. Fantastic. And so religion. Somebody, I think it may be like a bank teller. He's all going to bag on money. Excellent. Well done, Gabby. So yes, what do you think that means if he's targeting bankers? Well, bankers do normally make quite a bit of money. Yeah. And that's money that's coming out of society. Yeah. And so, and it's going straight into his pocket. Yeah. So. It's like saying, you know, kind of stop taking our money, you know, for yourself. Fantastic. So, yeah, so it's an emphasis on greed in particular and getting rid of that. So, excellent influence, Sid. Let's now go on to more of a kind of a debate task after, after we've used those sources. So, sir, could you move on to the next slide, please? Right. So... Using what we've just debated and those sources as well, I want you to have about two minutes to prepare yourselves for arguments for and against capitalism. So in your head, you're going to kind of create a table, so for and against. So I'm going to debate with you as well. And that's what you will find with A-level teachers, especially A-level history, is that you're going to have your teachers really debate and I'm sure that my historians sitting here have been at, well they've participated in that where I've challenged them and it does get you to question perhaps what you believe to be acceptable and so on and um, so have a quick chat amongst yourselves and try and create that you know for and against columns in your head I'm not going to listen in as I wouldn't in a lesson what would you say for against for both capitalism and communism. So which one is the best, up, best most viable? Yeah. I, I do do capitalism. I like communism. I like how I like like everyone is yeah. I don't like very much communism. I like Marxism. But that theory never was able to. That theory went into the... So that idea doesn't be going on about everybody's equal and all that stuff. That is probably idealistically utopian and great, you know, society is living, but in theory, it's not necessarily viable. And the more viable you think of capitalism, everybody's innately selfish and we need to be the best. And when we have communism, that leads to more state intervention, everybody making sure that everybody's not hurt and we're behind everyone. And then, like, you work hard for them. Yeah, exactly. I think communism never exactly work in terms of the whole population of the world because everybody at one point somebody is going to try to exactly. yeah. be higher than the other because there's always going to be people who are mm. satisfied with their station. Yeah. So if there's everybody wants to be up top, but not everybody can be up there. But then again like the cups and the rich, they just get rich on the poor people. Okay. That is true for them. Yeah. But, Okay, so I was going to let you go off, and again, this is what will happen. Your teachers will adapt to what the class is like, but this is really, really interesting because what you're doing is kind of going beyond of this idea of communism and capitalism. That these students are thinking more like A level students by going right. Let's look at you know the reality of it and look at you know elements of socialism, which is kind of the middle ground between communism and capitalism. So you've kind of gone right. We're not going for this 
one or the other let's actually look at what we could do in the middle but how do you think or is there a, a certain political economic system that you think is more viable which way shall they um i think personally liberalism i think that's quite a good like marriage so you brought in liberalism now. Yeah. You know, we can see the A-level politics student. <laughs> <laughs> it has elements of liberalism. However, it's not the quality of outcomes that people are looking for. Um, obviously, like the Labour Party is communism where everybody ends up with the same amount of money. So you don't agree with communism? No. Okay. It kind of relates a little bit to Marxism as well. How yeah. Like, how they believe that society is unequal because of capitalism. Yeah. So I don't agree with communism either, but I don't agree with capitalism yeah. either. No, so so it is so what I'm getting from you guys is that these two extremes, which they are, yeah. you don't like either, is what I'm getting across. There seems to be you're kind of fitting into that middle ground again. Yeah. Aziza, last point. There's things that I would like to take out of both of them. It's mm. not like I hate capitalism and I hate communism, mm. but there's some things that I would hate, like, like you said, um, starting with like, like equal point and then working your way up. I like that. Okay, thank you. Very informative. Um, do you have any questions for us? You can either ask me or the students. Go for it. Right, Miss. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. So, um, first question: uh, Would you do lots of debates or discussions in A level history? Oh yeah, of course. Um, it has been, of course, and I'm sure you two will test for this. Um, it's been a lot harder under COVID um, regulations to do certain things in regards to kind of setting the room up as so it feels more like you're debating. But yes, we definitely do. There's lots of, there is, of course, as A level history, there's lots of reading, lots of note taking, but we try to do the note taking outside of Latin. So then we can have more of those debates and how to do essays and so on in the lesson. So yes, we definitely do like a bit of a debate. The more vogue for the class in some regards, in some scenarios, the better. Um, do you want to talk about the breakdown of coursework and exams? Yeah. Um, so at the moment in year 12, so you do USA history, so you do 20th century American history, that is worth 30% and that is paper one. Paper two, which is 20% and that is South Africa. Um, and that is done with the head of history who spoke earlier. Then we have paper three, which is um, British political history. So that goes from around the 1800s up to the early 20th century. And then I do coursework, which is 20% in which you have to write an essay about the causes of the Russian Revolution. So welcome, Carol. And, and <laughs> and that coursework topic is fixed by us. Is yes, that, is I, that I, yeah, I pick I picked it because we have traditionally done Russia, um, and that's because we have all of the textbooks, all of the resources, and um, there's a lot of you know uh, assistance by myself. I provide the reading, I provide the questions, but then it's it's up to the students in regards to what argument they want to put forward. Okay, so in terms of topic choice, we, we fix that because we feel that we can support better if everybody's it, the same thing. Exactly. I've been to other schools where I've seen the history departments basically give freedom to their A-level students and I've looked at the grades for other six forms and looked at the grades for our six form for coursework and yes, I think the support needs to be there and it's very important it is. And obviously the exams themselves are heavily extended question based yes how do, so, we support, how do we support with the writing of essays and extended uh, questions so i what we do we provide um sentence starters we always plan essays with our students apart from the occasional ones where in assessments they don't get a choice so they will have to use um, what we've done in lessons, in structuring and scaffolding and so on for those students and um, they'll have to adapt it for when they get into those exam conditions. But there is a lot of support. It's a, we, as these students will set, attest to, I, every time I give out an essay, I will plan it with them to show them what to do so they don't feel completely and over overwhelmed. 
and that is from right at the start of the course. Lovely. And finally, to the students who do history, um, what, why did you choose it? What are your favourite things about doing it? And um, are you going to use it when you move forward into university? Um, I just enjoyed the subject at GCSE, especially America team. So yeah, that's why I chose it. And in the lessons, my favorite thing about it is when we get to discuss our own ideas and stuff, and hearing other people's ideas to to see how we can add or change your like, your own ideas. I'll give that. Um, I think it gives you a round of respect to the world because I feel like the past plays that's a prominent role in how we come here together and today. So um, being able to go out and converse with other people and um, like in high when you go to jobs and you know that you converse in the high sectors, you're able to have conversations that you know other people may not know about because you've got that context of you know how you got here and stuff like that. It, it's especially when we've done economic um, history, I would say in particular, um, there's a real understanding of how policies can have a long-term impact and so you can see the kind of students recognize that if the president puts in a certain policy in the 1980s for example that will have an impact on what happens in 20 years time and under future presidents okay lovely well thank you miss and thank you students um for giving us a little taste of history um we're gonna mute you now and sign you off so that the geographers can take over. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lutz, if you could unmute the microphone, that'd be great. 
Hi, Mr. Webb, it's Ms. Ellen. Oh, sorry. I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, how many students are you going to have in the room, Miss? Um, we've got three, two, three, two, need, two of us. We've got all of our students with us. They need to squeeze up and sit as close to the camera and mic as they can. Okay, if you move you that, can move that you're fine. You're fine. Uh, can you hear me, sir? I can indeed. Wonderful. Right. Just waiting, we've only got a few attendees, so just give it a minute and then we'll start. No worries. And you just need to give me a shout when you need to, need to move the slides on. Yes, I will do, no, not worry. Yeah. Um, well, we've done it in more than one area purely because some different students have different like subject arrangements. Um, okay. So we'll get started anyway, I think. Um, yeah. thank, thank you to everybody who's logged on for today's session. So my name is Miss Sutherland. Um, as of September, I will be Head of Geography, so I will be working with you very closely, working through some of the content. But today is just a good opportunity for you to see some of the things that we might be looking at if you were to choose geography at an A-level. If you can move over, please, sir. You can tap the next slide. Thank you, Mr. Webb. I've done that. Hopefully you can see it. Oh, there we go. It's just a bit delayed. Yeah. So in this very brief session, we are going to be looking at how influential is the role of TNCs in spreading globalisation. Now, globalisation is a very big topic, which we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail in a second. But before we do that, I want you to have a look at the picture that is on the board. Now, the picture on the board is an example of a thing called globalisation. If you could have a look at people at home, what do you think or can you suggest what you think globalisation could be? Students in the room, do you have any suggestions having a look at this image? Um, the um, transfer of different cultures and how that, that is represented in one's food. Good. So can, how have they represented it? Um, an example is in India is a primarily vegetarian country. So they would, instead of selling beef burgers or um, beef burgers, they would use things like the paneer, which is a cheese alternative. Yeah, good. So essentially, globalisation is adapting your product to fit in with the culture or the community that you are selling the product in. Now, this is a really good way of TNCs spreading influence around the world and in turn spreading globalisation. So can you move over to the next slide, please? Good. Tap again. Thank you. If you just keep tapping, let's just get the, put the points up, that's fine. So localization is the way that companies essentially adapt their products to meet the local needs traditions around the world. The prime example that we just looked at from the previous slide for McDonald's is, as Rosie suggested, you can't sell beef because it's a respected animal. So they have to adapt their product to an Indian audience. So this is the way TNCs enable themselves to adapt to different environments and actually become more influential businesses. So McDonald's, as we know, is a prime example, but Lego is in a really powerful position where they don't actually have to do that because their product is so um, adaptable to different audiences. They don't need to do that as much. If you can move over to the next slide, please, sir. Something. Have we got that? It's not what it's not moved. Uh, we are having some glitching going on. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, we're there now. Thank you. So as I said originally, globalization is actually a really difficult concept to try and define. And globalization is an example of how that they do that. So on the board, I have three different definitions. Lots of people, lots of different organizations have different ways they define it. Students in the room, can you have a quick read? I'll give you just about 30 seconds. Skimming over, can you come up with your own definition of what you think it might be representing? What do you think globalisation could be? 
um, it's just a lot of connections in the country and um, they can become dependent on each other. Good, fantastic. So in geography, often you will not be given your own definition. You'll not be taking it away with you. You have to find out how you would interpret it yourself. So looking at extracts, looking at different ways people interpret it would allow you to do that. If you could flick over to the next slide, please, sir. Wonderful. And if you just flick through the points, then hopefully they'll just pop up and we can just speak through them. So globalisation, as we said, is the world becoming more interconnected. And there's a huge amount of ways that this could be done. So it could be done through um, flows of goods, money, trade, people, ideas. So thinking back to, talk, uh, to TNCs, whoa, go back one, please, sir. <laughs> Can you think about how have TNCs actually contributed to the spread of globalisation? So what do TNCs do that cause globalisation to spread? Um, they invest in um, transport links, which enables the movement of people to different areas, as well as investing in basic infrastructure, like roads as well. Brilliant. And the internet. And the internet. Rosie, any other things that TNCs do that can encourage globalisation around the world, the world becoming more interconnected? Um, the idea that they can bring their culture to another country. So the idea of westernising places, which came from America. Yep. Um, and they did that through places like McDonald's, places, TNCs like McDonald's and Disney, Good. which is now global. Yeah, fantastic. So different ideas spread through TNCs. We've got trade, we've got goods, loads of different suggestions. If you can move on to the last slide then, please, sir. If it, if it moves over. It's coming. I've done it. Because we will get there. Anyway, we're going to be looking very briefly at an example of a TNC that has had a huge amount of global influence. So we're going to be looking at Disney. Disney is a key example that we look at when we are studying our topic on globalisation. And globalisation is something you will study in the first year of A-level geography. So thinking about it, can you at home and in the classroom think of some examples of how Disney has globalised to different locations around the world. So think back to that original definition about how they adapt their business. Can you think of ways that Disney has globalised around the world? Um, they've adapted some of their films, so it's set in different places like Aladdin, for example. Also the um, characters, uh, um, the theme parks are dressed in cultural clothes mm. as you would wear in those countries. Good, so think back to Aladdin. Rosie, can you elaborate a little bit further about what they did specifically with that um, film? With the character Jasmine, the way she's portrayed in the movie, she would be in, say, America and England, she's much more covered up, and that's just because of the culture um, in the country. Good, fantastic. And we've got other films as well. If you keep tapping through, sir, you'll see some pictures pop up. Other films, such as The Hunchback of Notre Dame, were produced just as Disneyland Paris was being um, opened in order to get more of a French market involved and wanting to visit. Um, we've also got other ways that Disney has become very global. We've got things like the Disney shop. We see them in the Bromley High Street, but all of those goods have been made in locations like China. So immediately that big product, Disney, has interlinked a huge amount of countries from all around the world. So your takeaway question that I'd like you to think about is, to what extent is Disney truly a global corporation? We're not going to answer that because it's a very big question, but it's some food for thought for the rest of the day. Thank you very much, sir. Um, have we got any Great. So if you've got any questions from people at home, please start filling them in on the on the in the box and I'll read some out. But let's start with the the classics. So in terms of geography, Miss, our students here, what do they tend to go on to do at university? So, we've got, so in terms of careers, there's lots that you can do with geography because it's a very broad area. So we've got some students going to study architecture next year. We've got some students looking at town planning. We've got some students looking at just pure geography as a possible degree to go into. Um, 
yeah, this is really end, endless. If you, you're looking more for a finance, something in the finance industry, again, that's reflective because you learn a huge amount of skills that you'd be able to incorporate in more of a business role too. So there's just some ideas that you can think of. And obviously an important part of doing geography, I did A-level geography, is getting out and about outside of the classroom and exploring the real world. So can you just outline some of the things that we do there? So in a normal year, um, we do try and take our students out on international trips because it's really important for them to be able to see the world. So we have had trips to places like Iceland, Barcelona um, and Naples. They're some of the places we try and take our students to. And as a part of the A-level um, just course in general, it's um, compulsory for us to take students out for a minimum of five days of field work. So that is a thing that we try to aim to do. We do try and focus the field work in more local areas, um, such as the Kent coast, but there's no reason we can't try and go a little bit further afield. Okay, if they haven't done um, GCC geography, are they stopped from doing geography or is it a disadvantage or does it not matter? Um, we have had students that have studied geography at A level that haven't actually studied it at GCSE before. Of course, there is the added level that they may not have the base level of knowledge that students studying at GCSE may have, but that shouldn't be a barrier if they have done well in their either history GCSE or have done well in science and English and we'll be able to get them through. That's not a problem. Right. And what's what's the rough breakdown between the physical and the human and the geography? So um, with every single topic, there's always an element of physical and human incorporated in it. So, for example, one of the first topics you'll study at A level is coasts. So within coasts, although it's predominantly known as a physical geography, there's a huge amount of, um, let's say, human geography incorporated in there because it's all interlinked um, and everything's interdependent on one another. So that's why we try and look at it more holistically, thinking about it all together. Lovely. And finally, um, the exams, I know this is all on the website, but um, how many exams do they then sit? So they've got three exams. Um, the first two are based purely off content. The last exam is based off of um, basically everything you've studied over the year. You get given a situation much like at GCSE paper three, and you have to use the knowledge that you've gained to answer questions based off of, yeah, based off the content. And the last thing they've got to do as well is also complete a piece of coursework. Um, and that is based off a question that they want to sort of research themselves. Normally students focus on something like diverse places or the places around them to try and make it a little bit easier when they're collecting field work. And um, lots of our geographers go off to university. We had a head girl a couple of years ago, go to Oxford to do geography. Um, so is that is that normal that many of our geographers go on to university? Yeah, we do often have quite a few geographers going to university. As you mentioned, Bethan, she went to study geography at Oxford um, a couple of years ago. Um, this year, I think we've had two geographers from year 13 go off to study at A level, which is fantastic. And it's such a, a broad degree to be able to do that opens so many doors if that's something that you are interested in. Uh, loads of graduate schemes think about, about it as quite a highly reputable degree to have because you learn so many skills um, yeah it's often we have a few students every year that study it lovely okay well, thank you very much miss thank you to the students for who come in all morning and that is this room now closing if if you are interested um, you can jump across to meet the prefects um, at 120 in room one followed by just the conclusion of the day at 1.40. This room's now going to be closed. Thank you very much, Miss. Thank you. Bye.